What do you prefer? I, I want to, you to feel comfortable with, the, with, the, with your presentation. Uh, if you feel comfortable, we are comfortable too. So you try whatever you want to, to be comfortable with your presentations. It's, uh, it, uh, because okay. we, are, we, are, we are really accustomed to wait until uh, the role presentation runs. And then after this, we made the questions, we, we start the debate, we have a, a break, and then Erika and Marcus uh, made their presentation and we have another run of, of debate. Okay. Um, I guess because time is sensitive and we have three, I should, we should just start. Otherwise it'll take another five minutes to set up. Okay, okay. Can you, and will you give me a warning when I, my time is running out? Maybe give me a warning 10 minutes before and then five minutes before and then say, Kevin, you have to stop talking. You're okay, okay, perfect. <laughs> You have uh, uh, 40 and uh, between 40 and 50 minutes. Okay. So, uh, uh, more or less uh, five minutes, 10 minutes, I will, I will say, Kevin, 10 mm -hmm. minutes, okay? Okay, that's perfect. So, uh, I, I just want you to, to authorize our, our, our uh, recording. Yes, so, of course. Okay, thank you. How All do I... you. Please uh, uh, write in the chat, uh, I agree or concord or, or anyway. I can't see the chat. So you can start when you want. You, okay. you, you stop it. Uh, you stop at your presentation. Okay. Okay, thanks. I'm going to put it full screen and then I will no longer be able to see you. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. You're Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm talking into a, just a screen. Um, okay, so thank you to Ana Maria and to Marcus and the other organizers, uh, it's an honor to be here with you. I'm going to basically just give you the argument from the introduction to a new book that I worked on with Daniel James, a historian of labor in Argentina. It's a collection of essays, Capitalism and the Camera. Okay, so that's the book, that's the cover of the book. Photography was invented in the years between the publication of Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations in 1776 and Karl Marx and Frederick Engels' The Communist Manifesto, published in 1848. The emergence of philosophical historical accounts of the division of labor, primitive accumulation, and commodity fetishism on the one hand, and of a practical mechanical method for fixing images on the other, is significant. One was a branch of thought that named a new object of analysis, the economy, a combination of the Greek oikos, meaning household, and nomos, meaning law. And the other a branch of popular mechanics and chemistry that sought to use the terms of the day to arrest nature by making copies that she herself appeared to trace without the clumsy intervention of a human hand that is, the writing with light, that is, photography. Beyond this twinned birth of technologies of reproduction in the age of empire, what are the connections between capitalist accumulation and photography? And might photography play a role in refusing capital's infringements upon human freedom and planetary life? These two questions are the basis of this book. So we have the economy, oikos and nomos, household and law, and photography, writing with light. Just before the invention of the economy and photography, another term was created, fossil fuel. Once again, light played a crucial role. The idea that ancient photosynthesis produced energy that various organisms relied upon as sources for their own development was first put forth in 1597 
but about a century after Europeans initiated the plunder in pathogenetic destruction of the indigenous communities of the Americas. By 1759, a German chemist named Caspar Newman used the term fossil fuel. Coal, petroleum, natural gas are the source of 85% of today's global energy consumption. Loss of species, the acidification of oceans, extreme heat and massive flooding, the melter of melting of the polar ice caps. Each of these impacts of global warming has dramatically accelerated since the 1992 publication of the UN Climate Change Framework. Each of these effects triggers others. Drought, wars over resources, the depletion of fisheries, mass migration, and racialized politics of exclusion. As world historical ecologists have convincingly argued, anthropogenic climate change is not being driven by the anthropos in general. It's not the Ache of Paraguay or Aboriginal peoples in Australia who are responsible for releasing 1,578 gigatons of, cap of CO2 from fossil fuels since 1751. Capitalism is generating these crises. Over the past 50 years, 60% of the species of mammals, birds, fish, and reptiles have been wiped out. The ecological cost of capitalism is clear. There have been social costs as well. The historic dispossession of indigenous peoples, the enslavement of Africans, and the relegation of women to the domestic and men to public, the public spheres were acts of violent appropriation and exclusion that still draw blood today. A global class structure more rigid and unequal than that of the 19th of 19th century Europe is now forming. We can talk about um, World War II, the destruction of capital, and that led to an increase in real wages for people across the North Atlantic. But that's all been reversed since the 1970s, as income inequality has sharply increased. The rise of incomes to the top 1% has brought few benefits in economic development. Instead, we're seeing stagnating, even declining real wages. Deaths of despair are on the increase in the rich countries. Drug overdoses, suicide, alcohol-related cirrhosis of the liver, and overall life expectancy for the poor, working-age people of all races in the United States is declining. In the face of this, concatenation of crises, you may ask yourself what any of this has to do with the camera. Capitalist consumption is a key factor driving global warming. The circulation of images in turn drives consumption. The desire to have a certain way of life is curiously first an image and only second a reality. I see, therefore I desire. At the same time, activists and artists use photography and video to produce images that serve as evidence or abstractions that might nudge various publics into changing their behavior or demanding change from their state. So this will be our first thesis. There is an intrinsic link between capitalism and the camera. To make this argument, we'll consider the logics of limitless accumulation and replication within the histories and ecologies that put real limits on them. We're dealing here with a heterogeneous image world, which I'd like for us to define as something like a cultural ecosystem of images 
from holy icons to paintings, photographs, film, video, MRIs, built environments, GPS coordinates, and public performances, as well as the material and epistemic infrastructures that enable the circulation of some images such that they acquire value or meaning. Our second argument will be that the camera, and here it's just using this as a shorthand, an alliterative shorthand for photography, can enable a critical understanding of capitalist relations of production, of the constructed nature of social worlds, and of the feelings that mobilize groups to act in concert. Medium specificity, that is the idea that photography is special, special because it bears an indexical relation to the world, is, will have an important role here. Photography in this conceptualization is causally connected to the space-time continuum. Photography, with its claim to the juridical, evidentiary, and disclosive, has been used not only to standardize production and to synchronize heterogeneous worlds into the homogenizing state in the global market, but also in attempts to expand human freedom and halt ecological violence. Actually existing photography, like actually existing capitalisms, is part of a broader range of image practices. Our third argument will be that the camera plays an important role in constructing publics. These are not, to be clear, enlightened shoppers or ethno-nationalists or civil spectators. Instead, what we mean by public is a collective subject formed within or against or across polities. Ideally, such a subject emerges in a democratic community and uses the state to expand human freedom and equality in a non-appropriative, non-acquisitive relation to all life, human and non-human. Photography can be a tool in this struggle. So this book attempts to bring photography, art, history, ecology, literature, colonialism, and alternative futures all into the same conversation. I could say more about the intersections between capitalism and what I mean by capitalism and photography and what we mean by photography. But for now, I'd like to just emphasize that while capitalism and photography have grown up together, they've rarely been thought together. Scholars of capitalism have largely failed to account for the role of photographic images in circulation, reproduction, and analysis of the histories and logic of accumulation. At the, tame, at the same time, scholars of photography have tended to assume that they already know how capitalism works in and through photographic images. So even as we call attention to this gap between studies of capitalism and studies of photography, we, in this book, we tried not to impose a new programmatic synthesis. Instead, we wanted to keep the very different approaches that scholars have taken in, in, into account without homogenizing them. We wanted them to sort of, we wanted to, to, if you will, accentuate the differences between different approaches to the visual, from art history to, to history to visual culture studies. So here, is an example of a photograph by Edward Bertinsky, a Toronto-based photographer. It's of a Chino mine in New Mexico. We chose this for the cover of the book because it is obviously a picture of capitalism. A mine is a sort of quintessential site for capitalist extraction. But this is also autonomous from capitalism in some important ways. First of all, the photographer selected a part of the world 
and excluded everything else. And he composed a meaningful syntax within the image. That road that goes to the right, the top of the frame, and leads out, leads us out of the mind and back into the world. This is a meaningfully constructed image, right? Everything about it is deliberate, is intentional, is there by design of the photographer. All right, so this relates back to a very old debate since the beginning of photography as, you know, uh, photography is infinitely more accurate than painting, etc. Kind of Edward Allan Poe's initial um, response to the daguerreotype versus Baudelaire's decrying photography as destroying art because it's just a machine made image. What we see in this picture is it is very clearly uh, a picture that represents capitalism, is of capitalism, but is also, it also in an important way, seeks to be autonomous from capitalism, to, do, to create a meaning that is separate from the process that it is depicting. Or from the art market on which this photograph eventually sells for lots of money. So the non-arbitrariness non -arbitrariness of the edges linking the mind through its roads to the world of industry outside the frame. We attempted to draw together different authors in disagreement. So we have, uh, we might think of one constellation of that forms out of the essays between Ariela Azule, Siobhan Angus, Christopher Stolarski, and T.J. Clark. In this constellation, we find the photograph as one, a document, a document of imperial plunder. Two, the photograph is the result of mining that is the precondition for photographic representation. And three, as agitprop for the socialist state. And four, as a tool, the advertising image, to stoke to the desire to consume. And here it's being subverted. More on that later. Another constellation can be found in what we might call a consideration of art images. So Walter Ben Michaels with the Latoya Ruby Fraser photograph at the top left, or Kadri Jain, uh, working on the artist, Indian artist Dayanita Singh's attempt to both push her art into the art market and fully embrace the art market and the commodity nature of photographs, but then to pull back from it and to give her art as a gift so that it subverts the traditional art market. To Blake Stimson's, uh, thinking about Paul Strand's photos as me a means for public deliberation, to John Paul Rico's uh, work on a collection of moths by Emmett Gowan, to Tong Lam's pictures of post-socialist China, where he makes the city into a dark room and projects images onto it. So while these authors would certainly disagree, disagree about key questions of photography, capitalism, and mo modernism, they're all dealing, the first constellation is dealing with non-art images. In this second constellation, the authors would disagree about questions of indexicality, medium specificity, and even on the agency of the ph photographer. Still, they're linked in important ways. I've already said a bit about this, um, and we're seeking to kind of deal with both of these issues, both the inattention to capitalism by scholars of visual culture, and that is real and true over the past 
20 years of, of writing. Uh, in, in, um, the, while that field of visual culture studies has certainly opened up vast arrays of archives of everyday non-fine art images as objects of new research, it's overwhelmingly favored scholarly approaches that are at altitudes fi far higher than that of political economy. Meanwhile, within art history, thinking about photography has tended until recently to focus on investigations of form and dexicality and abstr abstraction, often downplaying issues of the market and capital. So I want to I want to sort of go back I think, end that discussion there. I think I, we can talk more about it later if you like, but I want to, because time is, I want to keep moving through this. So perhaps the most obvious place to, to begin an examination of the relationship between capitalism and the camera would be to consider the massive photo archives of multinational corporations. Consider the United Fruit Company, which in the early 20th century challenged the sovereignty of Latin American countries, giving rise to the notion of co company-dominated banana republics. Photography was central to the company's endeavors. The camera helped link the company's headquarters in Boston to its various divisions in Honduras, Ecuador, Colombia, Panama, Costa Rica, Jamaica, Cuba, etc., etc. Documenting its accumulation of capital with, of course, the camera. This relationship is made particularly clear by the United Fruit Company's photograph collection at Harvard University, made up of around 10,400 pictures and comprising the official sanitized record of the company. So here we find that the company used photographs to present its work to shareholders and to the public to control nature at a distance, to scientifically analyze the most efficient way to ripen bananas, uh, to examine the spread of disease, to document the clearing of forest, tropical forests and the creation of new um, irrigation canals, uh, to convert biodiverse tropical forests into monocrop plantations and to monitor the health and productivity of its workers. We can add to this list the most ubiquitous use of photo corporate photography of all, advertising, through which the company sought to entice consumers into buying more bananas. So this is basically a textbook example of the connection between capitalism and the camera. But despite the actual overlap, between capitalist enterprises and their uses of photography, most recent thinking on this topic has re rendered the conceptual linkage between the two far more tenuous. This really important book uh, came out some years ago. It was a product of the art seminar sponsored by the Art Institute of Chicago, the University College Cork and the Buren College of Art. And what we find here is that the emphasis is placed on surveillance, the archive, and the discursive universe outside the photographic frame that produced the truth within it. Indexicality is a key term throughout the book, and that's not a problem. It's just to point out that um, the index in Foucauldian notions of the relationship between photography and art historical discourse displace any consideration of capitalism, imperialism, social class, not to mention pr primitive accumulation, expropriation, colonialism, speculation, uh, exploitation, etc. None of those key terms or categories of analysis make their way into this important book. So the issue is not simply that the history of photography mirrors the historical development of any other capitalist venture, proceeding from the destruction of artisanal modes of production to the increasing mechanization and massification of image producing technology. 
You can think of bananas here, right? Bananas are initially produced by small growers who owned a small plot of land. They grew coffee and beans and corn and bananas on that small plot of land. And the excess bananas they could smell, sell in a market to shippers. That 40 years later, those artisanal modes of production are decimated and replaced by monocrop plantations owned by just two or three giant banana companies based in the United States. Capitalism, yes, and photography have that trajectory, but they also share a, a logic of abstraction, alienation, and of the conversion of use value into exchange value. So photography, just as capitalism alienates certain goods from minds and hands that produce them, photography takes the traces of light reflected off of actual objects and converts them into images, representations of something in the world. In other words, capitalism and photography are not only functionally interrelated, they are a historically and conceptually bound pair. That's the argument that Danny and I are trying to make in this introduction, one of the three main arguments. The banana's transformation into a commodity was coeval with its transformation from fruit to trace image in the United Fruit Company archive. So this is part of our argument. Yeah. So we're not making a teleological argument. We're not trying to say that all previous modes of pictorial uh, representation would ultimately lead to photography. That is definitely not what we are saying. Instead, what we are saying is that as they've historically developed, the two have enjoyed a symbiotic relationship. And it makes it difficult for one to, to survive, to imagine one to survive and what the other not. Um, we're suggesting that the logic of exchange and production of value under capitalism is analogous to photographic replication. Photography and capitalism are premised upon a fiction of endless accumulation in a finite world. And there's a sort of nervous vibration between the concrete and the abstract that characterizes both. So in what other ways does capitalism seem to entail photography? We could talk here about um, Benjamin famously seeing in photography a democratization of the production and reception of images. We could talk about Krakauer saying that the camera essentially um, allows us, he's first, at first, as you remember, very pessimistic about photography and what it does to, to make us into bigger idiots than we already are. Uh, but then he, he ends that short essay on a hopeful note, saying that photography helps us dissect the social order, to denaturalize the social order. We can take this early photograph from Daguerre, and Alan Sekula famously analyzed this image. And basically the point that I'd like to make here is to remind us of Sekula's argument about photography always being haunted by labor, human labor. And so in this image, uh, the person getting his shoes shined at the bottom is there, the bourgeois man is there. But because of the movement and the long exposure time required to make this image, the shoe shine, the proletariat, the worker who was behind this image coming into being, gets erased. And in that way, labor is always, and the materiality of photography is always there, 
always um, a precondition for photography's existence. We can think of the silver mine as well that Siobhan Angus writes about in her chapter in this volume. There's also a problem of capitalism pretends and seeks to be global and photography might enable us to see how it works, to see the whole, if you will, to see the abstraction. Alan Zakula tried to do this in a film called The Forgotten Space. Here we can just see the trailer for it. Midstream, a muddy estuary near a port, forgotten space, out of sight, out of mind. Upstream, the hinterland, the greedy continent. Downstream, other ports, great harbor cities, oceans, 100,000 invisible ships, one and a half million invisible seafarers, binding the world together through trade. The unlikely story of a steel box that changed the world trading system. Ships now resemble floating warehouses, plying fixed routes between producing countries and consuming countries, while factories become ship-like, stealing away in the dead of night in search of cheaper labor. Does the anonymity of the box turn the sea of exploit and adventure into a lake of invisible drudgery? Does this box, the acme of order, efficiency, and global progress, create disorder and destruction and throw the world out of balance? So what Sekula was trying to do there was to represent these abstract flows. So art, in his view, could counteract the fetishization of financial transactions and the almost unfathomably abstract nature of global capitalism. He did it by trying to make visible what we don't see, the shipping routes from Hong Kong, China, to Antwerp, to Los Angeles, to Bilbao, etc. And um, he was trying to make visible this in seemingly invisible notion of consumer credit, of derivatives, of an economy that was fueled by ever more complicated ways of selling risk and securing capital. So he found the unexpected um, human costs of global shipping. Another way, so what we're trying to say here is, and in addition, is that photography is only one medium within an expanded overlapping and out of sync image world, video, painting, and all kinds of other forms of image production are a part of this image world. I would like here, I was going to give you a, a quote, I seem to have lost it on my screen, but I wanted to give you a quote um, to link back to, to the Sekula bit. Um, Frederick Jameson famously said, without a conception of the social totality and the possibility of transforming a whole system, no properly socialist politics is possible. It involves trying to imagine how a society without hierarchy, a society that has also repudiated the economic mechanisms of the market, can possibly cohere. And so we might say that that attempt to see the whole, 
that Sekula is engaging in in that film is necessary to understand capitalism and to imagine alternatives. And we are aware that there are other projects to see the whole. Uh, religion offers its projects of seeing the whole and explaining the entire world, and science offers its, etc. cetera. Um, so maybe photography can strive to picture the abstract nature of capitalism. This photograph, it's, it's actually a pictograph, uh, a petrograph, I should say, a petrograph uh, by Warren Carew, might help us to begin to think about an actual photographic practice that crosses the universal and the intimate. So this is from the Canadian Métis artist Warren Carew, and he makes these what he calls petrographs, by going out into the forest of near his hometown in Saskatchewan and gathering raw bitumen from rivers and creeks. It's just there at the surface. He scoops it up into a bucket, puts that goopy black stuff into a bucket, leaves a little bit of tobacco as a gift for the earth as he's taking something from it, and then he goes and prepares a uh, he smears this bitumen on metal plates, puts a transparency over it, and the transparency is of photographs that he himself has made of the sin crude processing plants, petroleum processing plants, in where he lives. And then he puts that out in the sunlight for something like eight hours, and the sun changes the bitumen to create an image of the world. So this is one of the critiques of aerial photographs. A common critique is that aerial photographs of mines, of oil fields, of lithium ponds, and toxic waste dumps, it, it, the critique often runs that they aestheticize environmental destruction, that they render environmental destruction beautiful. And indeed, some people have critiqued Edward Bertinsky's mining photographs for that reason. Part of the apparent beauty of despoiled spaces arising, arises from distance from them, the same distance that enables an understanding of the whole also breaks the intimate connection that could be fostered with that space. So carry you is actively inventing an artistic practice that attempts to keep both the distance and the intimacy of petromodernity in play. He calls this a petro-intimacy that takes bitumen as habitat and reroutes just a tiny bit of it from the pipeline out of the extractive path that underwrites a certain quality of life in our era. These are non-spectacular images. They're noxious. If you breathe near them, you, it's like you smell the chemicals. Uh, they're toxic images. Here, you can see yourself in them. It creates a weird relationship as you try to view it. You have to shift position depending on where the light is and how you see it. When you look at it, it, it shifts if you tilt it to the sun from a positive to a negative. He writes, what intrigues me most about this image is that it is essentially bitumen, that is the raw material for our, that we heat our homes with in Canada, um, the material of the petrograph being the same thing as the exposed bitumen it depicts, signifier and signified, collapsing, merging. To me, this is the raw opening, the revelation of ecological violence, that is at the heart of petro-modernity. So photography, we could say, might play a role in building radical, radically just societies. Well, let's pose it as a question. But it turns out that when we ask this question, we're immediately inquiring into the nation state 
and to spectacle. That is the moment when, to quote Guy Debord, the commodity has achieved the total occupation of life, end quote. Liberal democratic citizenship is negotiated in part through photographic images. The, think of the iconic image where it's supposedly represents something of who we are as citizens, and then we rework it, we deface it, or we put a hat on the woman, or we do something with the iconic image that everyone in our societies can immediately recognize and identify with or, or de-identify with. So photos um, can be a mechanical and artistic means for constructing and consolidating a democratic citizenry. But within the spectacle, in this primitive accumulation, T.J. Clark and the members of the editorial collective Retort wrote, primitive accumulation is to be carried out in conditions of spectacle. That is the new reality in a nutshell. He was writing this in the, he and the others were writing that sentence in the wake of the US invasion of Iraq. I think I've just reached 30 minutes, Anna, is that right? Yeah, yes, uh, you started 1117. So you have uh, 10 minutes or to, to wrap up your, your arguments. Perfect. 10 minutes is enough. Thank you. I'll set my alarm too. Um, okay, so primitive accumulation is to be carried out in conditions of spectacle. That's the new reality in a nutshell. Here we see primitive accumulation and a certain questioning, a troubling, a destabilizing of the spectacle by making noxious, toxic images. So, of course, the tempo and ubiquity and vividness of image production are important, T.J. Clark notes, but on their own, they're radically insufficient. What matters, to continue quoting Clark, politically and socially is not the tempo and ubiquity so much as the power to persuade, the power to entrance, to become the image user's form of life. The, we might say that Warren Carew's Petrographs try to trouble this notion of spectacle and the spectacle kind of being a parasite on our social values. What we have in the, um, I would like to, I mean, Let me just say one more thing about this photograph. Carrier's artistic response to fossil fuel capitalism in his backyard is neither appropriative, nor nostalgic, nor denunciatory, nor apocalyptic, nor repressive, nor disenfranchising. Instead, his image making is a world making that critiques capitalist modernity, while also through this uncanny art positively calling into being a community that may survive it. And to use an analytical term developed by Jacob Emery, the author of the epilogue, uh, we could describe Curious Petrographs as capturing the art of the industrial trace. So images are often about enchantment, despite the efforts of modernists to cleave art off from religion secularizing it and freeing us from the embarrassment of superstition, totems, and the presence of the gods in our lives. But art can still offer cosmologies, some of which have been, may have long been considered vanished. Others alive in small groups, and still others that no one may have anticipated. 
capitalism destroys worlds, but it's also possible. It makes it possible for us to make new ones. So the book tracks three clusters of problems and possibilities. The first section, accumulation, posits linkages between capital's destruction of life worlds and the production of images. Ariela Azule provocatively asks readers to consider 1492 as the year of photography's birth. And from there, Siobhan Angus provides us with an account of silver mining as a precondition for photography. And she argues that the metallurgist and the striking mine worker are close kin to the photographer. The third essay in that first section is by Kadri Jain, who argues that thinking from the post-colony of India enables us to reconsider medium-specific notions of photography as the product of one particular post-enlightenment universalizing discourse. The second main section of the book, Critique, goes in search of the structures and fault lines within the heartlands of contemporary capitalism. Photographic form and artistic intentionality, Walter Ben Michaels argues, are means of making the structuring power of social class visible and for imagining alternatives. And he uses that Latoya Ruby Fraser picture and, and others um, beautifully, the mom and the photographer in a mirror. Working with the advertising image, TJ Clark asks if there are signs that the image world of consumer capitalism is beginning to fail. And the photograph that I showed you of the looters coming out with a poster of Jackson, I mean, Justin Bieber, uh, is a, he has this term called the unelated looter. And this was people in London just looting stores um, and serious, treating the looting almost as if it were a job they had to do. And then somebody cleverly on the internet photoshopped one of the looters carrying a Justin Bieber poster. He wasn't actually, but uh, the, the internet had fun with that. Um, <clears throat> and so <clears throat> John Paul Rico in another essay in that section closes by tearing with the limits of photography in the space in the in the face of species extinction and he argues for an expanded understanding of photography as a relationship to leaving ending and the left behind the third section of the book is called state and it considers the potential of photography to foster sociality Blake Stimson begins by noting that photography is an intrinsically privatizing medium, but he moves from there to show that it can sometimes be used to foster public deliberation. Yet even the most radical experiments in photographic practice have been co-opted for state propaganda, Kristolarsky argues in a chapter on Soviet press photography. The section closes with photographer Tong Lam's reflections and his conversion of the outdoors into a public darkroom for projecting images. Lam talks about the role of cameras in mobilizing resistance to urban industrialization in China. The book ends with an epilogue by Jacob Emery that moves between panorama and detail between utopian Soviet experiments and collectivization in giant earthworks like the one that you see framing this screen that can be remediated more cheaply as artworks than as functioning ecosystems to argue that, quote, photography is uniquely equipped to represent the raw edge between a legible scene and the larger world from which it has been wrested. So if there is a conclusion for us here, this is it. Photography most often works in the service of capital, seducing consumers and short-circuiting our critical faculties. Yet, 
we can we're searching here for notions of photography that encompass that also encompass its juridical evidentiary and formal capacity to disclose how our worlds are assembled and might be reassembled along more just lines. So the leap motif of this book is that photography, with all its limitations and its many varieties, can critically engage capitalism, enabling us to grapple with the political and economic structures of our era and to imagine new ones. And that's all I have for today. Thank you. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I don't know how to stop, stop sharing my screen. Okay. Yeah, so we can applaud. <laughs> nice great. to see you again. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's really threatening when we have to to present in Google uh, in 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 Google Meeting because we we cannot see our audience. But uh, uh, unfortunately, with uh, uh, we we have uh, we have begun without presenting you, Kevin. So uh, uh, I will I will I will uh, uh, ask Marcus. To, to, to record your presentation so we can have this recorded and then the, the open, uh, 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 Marcus is really in this section and open the, the, uh, the, the debate. So Marcus is with you and then I will participate in the debate too. Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Um, my English is very terrible, but uh, I try to speak if uh, as, um, it is. Today, we have a communication from Professor Kevin Coleman. Kevin Coleman is a historian, professor at the University of Toronto, and his research examined the inter inter interaction uh, between capitalism and photograph, primarily in late America. He is the author of uh, Camera in the Garden of Eden. It's a very good book. <laughs> a number of uh, books, chapters, and journal articles as well as the principal investigator of Visualized American, a modern digital humanist project. And in his most recent publication is the compilation Capitalism and the Camera that uh, you, that he spoke uh, today for us. And we are thankful for your acceptance into our seminar. Uh, and now, we will start with the question from the public. We can have a set of questions and you answer after. I think it's easy to answer this way, okay? Now, so we can, the people's are, are questions of, don't you want to start with your question, Marcus? Or you have okay. a question? <laughs> uh, no, I have, I have, I have, um, I try to read. I have a question with two points that are connected. And uh, in your book and this uh, presentation, you indicate that the, there, is, there is a separation between the scholars of capitalism theory and the scholars of visual culture in the North Atlantic academic but you suggest that the reader will find in the book a different way to answer to the goals who deal on photograph and possible strategy to put these two areas of knowledge together. So, so do you consider that the chance in the visual culture studies are related to the most recent crisis of capitalism? And, and the other point, is about the studies of photograph in the colonial compass. The majority of these studies show the sensitive uh, relationship between colonial violence and making an image from the other person, mainly because it had been made on a racist basis. Do you think that the change in visual culture studies are also to, to a greater interaction and extent with the scholars from the global south, and they are different theoretical perspective. Uh, I, I, I went so much to hear uh, the questions. Uh, we also have Ana Clara and Mariana. 
uh, uh, they will make the questions and then I will uh, return the, 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 to you. Okay, Kevin? Ana Clara, it's, it's you. I think I can speak in English. Uh, I love the presentation. I thought the, the structure of the presentation was very exciting. Uh, I love the way that you put the information and contextualization of the things. And my question is more speculative, I think. I was thinking about the transformation of this relationship during the pandemic period, the image and the capitalism and our consumption and our desire for products in the pandemic period. I think that it turned out to be more complex. So I was thinking if you could talk a little bit about that, it would be very interesting. And I really am really excited to read the book. I am really looking forward to it. Thank you. And one more, Mariana. Ah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin, for your presentation. I also are very curious to read the, the, the book. It's some, I think you state some, some very important questions and that relation between capitalism and photography. Um, my question is, in your presentation, you address the, this important connection between capitalism and photograph. The historians, some historians that study uh, slavery in the 19th century, they say also that there is a period of a second slavery that starts in the end of 18th century and gets through the 19th century. And this, this period, this second slavery also had a very specific relations between capitalism and slavery in this period of time. So during your, your presentation, I was thinking that, um, do you think the fact that uh, enslaved people and an important, were an important reference or a, a theme for the photography in 19th century also, also contributed for this commodizations of the enslaved people bodies and were part of that relation between capitalism and the camera that you set. So uh, it's uh, with you. My question is, do you think also there is a third element during the ninth century in this composition, slavery, phot photograph and capitalism? It's with you, Kevin. You have the word. Well, um, thank you for the questions and comments. Uh, Ana Maria, perhaps you can help me with some of the, if I didn't quite understand the questions, you can help me kind of get okay, okay, to the okay. gist of the questions. Um, so, Marcus, the the second question, I didn't capture, catch the first question. The second one was colonial violence in making an image of racism. What, um, can you tell me what your, what the question was? I mean, there is clearly a connection. Um, uh, it, and we have loads and loads of archives that demonstrate there's a clear connection between, um, colonial violence and image making. But uh, can you tell me the question again? I didn't quite capture it. I mean, we all written in the chat. I think it's better. Oh. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let me look for the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, oh, do I, you think the changes here? Do you think the changes in visual culture studies mm -hmm. are also related to greater interaction and exchange with scholars from the global south and their different theoretical perspectives? Because um, mm -hmm. uh, you are together the capitalism, fear of uh, visual studies in the book. Yeah. But in many scholars with the South Korean studies, photography and colonial context together the the violence in own photograph yeah uh, so yeah no and i think yes for sure i think the um 
I think another part of the problem is that uh, is also discipline specific that uh, people, historians who care about vernacular archives, that is non fine art images, have been more concerned for longer period of time uh, on this in particular, colonial violence uh, in, all, in many different manifestations. And so historians of photography have not necessarily been theorizing visual culture. A lot of the theorizing about visual culture has been done by art historians and media studies people um, who haven't had capitalism or colonial violence as their key concerns. So part of it is not only uh, a global south, global north um, dialogue or disjunction. Another is a sort of disciplinary um, not having sufficient cross fertilization. Does that make sense? And then um, I missed the first question. Do you have? Do you want to put that in the chat as well? Okay. The first is um, uh, the Christ, the recent Christ. Oh. So, do you consider that the changes in visual culture studies are related to the most recent crisis of capitalism? Mm -hmm. um, Maybe, um, maybe, but I think one of the issues is that um, we didn't think of capitalism as our key analytical category for a long time. For, um, you know, it was very, in, in, say, in history. Are you also training to be a historian, Marcus? A historian? Yes. Okay. So in history, in the 60s and 70s, um, you know, it was all about social history and social movements and gender history, etc. That's important and it's crucial and we don't want to give up those histories at all. But there, it became very unpopular to study capitalists like the, <laughs> the patron or the corporation, um, even though the, the capitalists are really the ones that succeeded. And the social movements are often the ones that got crushed, right? But we still write books and books about the social movements and the heroic workers or the heroic um, slave rebellion or whatever. But in the end, the capitalists usually won. Um, and so uh, we partly we have to, this is not to say that any of those social histories were wrong or that we shouldn't it, keep writing them. It's only to say that we also have to look at who owns things, who who owns the means of production, who owns the means of circulation of images, who decide what who decides what counts as an image that we all get to see, um, where that decision is made. Uh, so I guess part of it is we is is um, an inattention in in our sort of need to tell ourselves stories of that are hopeful um we've also lost focus on who owns what and and the impact of that, that and i think that is true for visual culture studies as well um yeah so then um anna clara the transformation of the relation between the image and capitalism during the pandemic. Can you say more about that? What you observed? I believe that changed a lot because the products turned to be in the images, in the daily, daily lives, you know, of people. And I think that it's much more dangerous, you know, because we are not even separating things anymore. So I believe, I don't know how to theorize that, but I am thinking a lot about that, you know, so I, it's just this. I, I don't have anything more elaborated than that. Mm -hmm. So do you mean that, um, that during the pandemic, we came to relate to each other more through screens than in person is one way that this happens? And to products 
to, to the consumption, to the desire of things, of objects, of uh, it's different, I believe, because yeah. we don't go out. We are just seeing other lives in Instagram, in social media. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, the pandemic is this, uh, it, it's played out so differently in, in different places and within the same society among different social groups. So we are impacted, this pandemic differentially impacts people. It, uh, those of us who, um, you know, have the luxury of working from home or from our basements or from our bedroom are not impacted in the same way as those who have to keep stocking shelves at the grocery store no matter what, uh, or keep driving that bus no matter what. So I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, the other, another interesting thing about the pandemic is that for a while, it sort of um, looked like capitalism was at least kind of over in some ways. Like, you know, how you had Donald Trump doing a guaranteed basic income um, for people. Uh, that's an idea that the far right in the United States would have never supported before, but just sending checks to people to provide us some sort of universal basic income was, was a radically anti-capitalist um, policy solution that, that even the far right embraced for some time. Um, and support for small businesses in the countries that were wealthy and could afford it. Um, and among a lot of us who just stopped buying stuff and traveling and just started making stuff at home and, you know, walking in our neighborhoods instead of traveling to, to Rio or Montevideo for the meetings. Um, I don't know to answer, to try to respond to your question. I don't, I don't have any idea. Um, and then on the other hand, it's like you suggest, like, you know, there's this enormous concentration of wealth during the pandemic, where Jeff Bezos made more in like one second than most of the world did in, in 10 years. Um, because people are shopping from home, they're clicking Amazon buy that. And, you know, um, it's really easy. They're not exposed and they get the product delivered right to their doorstep. Um, so yeah, so the pandemic accelerated all of the inequalities that were already really dramatic. Um, I don't, yeah, so I mean, I think you probably have much more interesting yeah, things to say about it. Than great, I. it's great. It was just, uh, I don't know, just to think about it. Like, I love it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and so Mariana, the connection between capitalism and, and slave, capitalism and photo photographs of enslaved people. Um, the, I didn't, the third theme, I didn't quite capture, but I, so in, I think the, the basic theme would be the slavery. Slavery. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. From, um, that connection. Right. I, I subsume slavery under capitalism. A sla a ca cap a slavery is a capitalist practice um, of commodifying human life. Um, and uh, it's, it's racialized capitalism, but it, at its core, it is a capitalist practice. Uh, um, and a plantation is central to it as a big machine, like a big factory for just squeezing more labor out of human beings and out of plants, but, but mainly human beings. And photography, I'm not sure. I, I actually, I would wonder if it weren't the opposite of, uh, I think part of your question was, did photography in this second, what you called second slavery, I guess, building on the work of other historians you, you, were, you were acknowledging, um, that photography may have sort of accelerated that, um, the, the, the process of second, the second slavery by fetishizing images of slaved, enslaved peoples. One might also argue that photography helped us question slavery. So there, um, there's the famous image of the escaped slave 
who shows his hand or her hand that's been branded um, to a photographer. And then they, the abolitionists send this photograph of a branded hand uh, around the, the United States to raise an awareness about the brutality and barbarism of slavery. Or Sojourner Truth, a famous activist uh, who, if I'm not mistaken, she had, she may have been the most photographed woman in, in the United States in the 19th century. Uh, and Frederick Douglass was the most, as far as I know, the most photographed man in the in 19th century United States. Um, and so the, they were all using photography to write, a, to tell a different story of enslavement, of blackness in the United States and of their own humanity. And in that regard, photography may have served as a tool of liberation. There's no question, though, that um, for those for all of those photographs, there were also photographs uh, made by Harvard ethnologists of enslaved people that completely degraded them and were used to try and create theories of racial inferiority. And those photographs became documents to sort of vouch for the truth of their theory of racial inferiority. And those photographs now occupy a special space in a Harvard collection. Um, and that kind of extractive violence in the first place is still, um, Harvard hasn't exactly given up those images. They haven't uh, gotten rid of them. They try to recontextualize them, all this. But in a way, it's a kind of primitive accumulation that Harvard still benefits from. So, yeah, I hope that responds to your thought. Oh, thank you. You respond and also you give me more information and uh, material to think about the abolitionism uh, too. And if you don't mind, I also would ask you if you have it. Uh, and if you don't have it here, maybe we can change, we, uh, you can pass me by email the reference uh, about this uh, image, of the, the, yeah. the abolitionism with the hand, because I don't know. I know the, the, the Susan True and, and the Frederick Douglass pictures, but no, I don't know that one. So if you could. Yeah, um, the, there's a, in Ariela Azule. Um, in the Civil Contract of Photography has a chapter about that image of the escaped slave. Oh, great. Thank you. Mm. So, and the one about the Harvard um, collections oh, Harvard. is, um, it just last week there was an article in the Atlantic about that. Uh, so it's part of the public conversation right now about these photographs of enslaved people. And this is also a public uh, dispute uh, uh, about this, this exactly, yeah. exactly, yes, yeah. So we have a, a, a second round of questions, and then we have a, a short break, and uh, uh, we will return uh, with uh, Marcos, Erica, and Marcos. So <laughs> we have Bruno, uh, we have Marcos, and we have Nathaniel. I, I, I retract my 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 question, and I will. I will ask you later, okay? So we have, we have the, the audience participating. So now we have Bruno. Hi, Kevin. Congratulations. Hi. Nice to meet your you. Presentation. Thank you. Uh, I didn't read your book yet, but I will. And my question is from the circulation of image point of view. Uh, the image banks nowadays so nowadays so available like Google Images are big examples of the capitalistic circulation of images. I would like to hear you about the viewer, the viewer seen as an image consumer and how the con decontextualized images banks contributes to alienation of photogra photographs and photography as a commodity.
Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Um, it, if you guys can also do what Marcus did and type your question into the chat, that's really helpful because then I'll be able to remember it. Okay. But I think I, I, I've taken some notes, Bruno, and then I may come back to you. I'll, I'll mute myself, Anna. Okay. Now, uh, no, I was trying to organize. I thought you were going to 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 answer him now. Okay. So uh, we have Marcus and, and and Bruno will will type the the, the question in the chat. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Kevin, for your speech. It was very uh, insightful. Uh, my question is about uh, the work of John Tagg, which is referenced uh, in a footnote or in an endnote of your and Daniel's uh, introduction. So, uh, but it's, it's the only uh, time he is ever mentioned in the book, I guess, if I'm not wrong. Uh, that's an author that, it, that I like, but he's very criticized for uh, not looking at photographs per se, but something outside it that would capture the meaning of, uh, of the photograph. Actually, his second book is named uh, Capt The Violence of Capture of Meaning or something like that. Uh, but he has a very special chapter in the Burden of Representation uh, called The Currency of Photography. So. Uh, I would like to hear you about uh, this idea because he's dealing with the New Deal and the do documentary uh, projects at that time and uh, defending or arguing that photography has a currency just like money would have. When we think of currency, we think of money and we think of capitalism. So uh, could you uh, maybe develop a little bit about this idea of photographs having a currency, which I am, uh, I am uh, like, I'm thinking of it from John Tag's perspective, but uh, it doesn't have to be his perspective. I just remembered that idea from that very nice book of him. That's it. Now we have Nathaniel. <clears throat> Hello. Thank you very much for your presentation, Kevin. I very much enjoyed it. I have two comments and then one small question. One is that in, as you spoke about capitalism and photography, I thought of two Latin American photographers who you might be interested in looking at more. And one would be Mark Fajese's photos of the coffee industry in Brazil. Um, and the other one would be Robert Hersman's uh, photography, photographs or photograph collection in Colombia um, that he did in contrast, especially with his photographic projects on Bolivia and Chile, which you'll see a project. Now, as someone who studied business administration in his first degree, um, of course, the thing that, that kept shot, jump out, jumped out to me the most between capitalism and photography is, of course, marketing. Now, you mentioned that in the very beginning of your presentation, but I'd be curious to know how much your book delves into this um, relationship between phot photography, marketing, and capitalism. That's it. Should I, Ana Maria, yeah, should I sure, sure, sure. respond? I, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, sure great. Done. Okay, thank you um, to all three of you for these questions. Uh, Bruno. Kevin, I would like to hear you talk about circulation of photographs and image banks as an example of capitalist consumption of photographs, especially the alienation caused by decontextualized image banks. Um, I don't know. Um, I uh, Image banks, in a way, like... So, in, okay, a couple of thoughts. One is that image banks in some ways uh, continue a process of primitive accumulation that started far earlier. So the photographed subject is rarely compensated, especially if they're an ordinary person, a poor person, 
uh, and the photographer is the one that made the money. And now even the photographer doesn't make much money. It's the owner of the image, Getty or Magnum or AP or whatever these large um, image companies, Alamy seems to be buying everything right now. Um, so yes, in a way, the, the process of primitive accumulation that started with the snapping of a picture of, I know Nathaniel has written about street children in Mexico, a, a, the process of snapping a picture of street children in Mexico is, a, can be exploitative and extractive. And then when we go and put it on the internet and some company like, let's just say Getty is making, charging us to use that image and charging us, uh, you know, to reprint it in the newspaper or in an article that you're working on. Um, that process of extraction is only accelerated uh, now because we don't even, we can, there's no way of compensating the original um, person from whom the image was taken. That's one side of it. On the other side, there's only, there's something uh, radically democratic about these image banks. Like I get onto them all the time and use images without giving you know people the rights to them. And so, like I mean, you 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 use it and you probably do too in your teaching. You can go onto an image bank, pull it, and then use it in your teaching, uh, and that's a very uh, accessible way to just grab images. Um, in there's something democratic about all of us having access to these images. Of course, this is also um, breaks down in geographic ways and racialized ways and er city versus countryside, who has access to these images. Um, and is also a problem that uh, most of the time we think we're looking at the image, but in some ways it's a company extracting information from us, or, um, you know, where there's all the metadata, the actual interesting stuff that the company wants is not the picture itself, but it's the metadata encoded into these images um, that enable what Susanna um, Zuboff has called surveillance capitalism. So we become the resource that's mined um, by these companies like Instagram, Facebook, Google, that are extracting information from us as we post our images up there. Hmm. Okay, I hope that responds to your thought, your question. Marcos. My question was about John Tagg's idea of the currency of photography. How does it relate to the perspective of the book and why? Uh, is he not mentioned besides a footnote? Yeah, um, I haven't read that. I have the book on my shelf here, but I've not, I, if I've read that chapter, The Currency of the Photograph, it must have been like 20 years ago because I have no idea what it, uh, what it was, says in that, what he says in that chapter. I do remember the, the chapter about um, the walk, the uh, Margaret Bork White photographs of the people lined up uh, in a bread line in, in the American way of life billboard is right behind them in tag writes a very really movingly about that photograph and what Bork White was up to with that juxtaposition. Um, I think the main point we're trying to make is is actually rather basic. It's that and you you said it in in the way you posed the question that there's a lot of interest in the discursive, and not as much interest in what's actually going on in the photograph. Um, and so, yes, to some extent, the meanings of the image are um, determined, if you will, by all of these factors outside of the frame. On the other hand, um, there's the potential within some photographs to make meaning that is autonomous from the discursive um, constraints within which the photographer operated. Um, it's not. It's not to say that that, that it's somehow um, outside of discourse. It's just that the photographer tries to set up a language that. It has meaning internal to the frame. 
And that is interesting. Um, it's a, it's also a discursive act, but it's a um, act that that um, that sets up it, that that works within a set of rules that it tries to reconfigure. Um, so I, the main thing we were trying to say is that. In, to, I, I want to say it clearly. Basically, we felt like there's in visual culture studies and in and in among our fellow historians, the pendulum has shifted too far away from art photography, and we are losing all of the contributions that art historians have made uh, and have enabled us to think about intentionality in image production. And if we go so far to thinking about discourse and um, all of these other aspects of the image, we will squash it and we won't understand why it is interesting and what it says about the world that's unique. And that's why it's really important, I think, for us to keep the art historians in the conversation, to keep intentionality in the conversation. And I think that the the tag move away and toward discourse gives up something and we we want to try to bring that back in and that's why we chose this photo um that's clearly an art image and also part of the market uh nathaniel right does that marcus does that work okay um nathaniel's yeah uh, these folks, Mark Fedez and Robert Gerstmann, thank you um, for these references. I'll, I'll check out their work. Um, and then marketing. Yeah, I mean, the main essay that, that really takes it up is TJ Clark's. Um, it's, uh, it's Capitalism Without Images, and it's just a beautiful essay. Um, it's it's, it's mind-blowingly good. Um, capitalism without images. He's thinking about through the picture of the elated looter. He's starting. He's wondering uh, what if if the image world stops. Um, if our circulation of images slowed down, what would that do to capitalism? Right, because consumer their marketing works by. Um, keeping the gap open between our desire and its fulfillment. And um, the cigarette sort of epitomizes that, right? You satisfy that desire and then 60 seconds later, you've smoked it and you have to consume, you have to go buy another Marlboro and light it up again. And then you just, the that's how marketing works and that's how consumption works. Keeping that gap in the advertising image, he says, is by keeping that gap open between desire and its fulfillment. And that's how he thinks through these advertising images and starts to wonder um, if capitalism could, could continue to exist. It's provocative without this um, crazy circulation of images. I mean, I guess the short answer to that is that it did before, didn't it? Because the Dutch were good capitalists before photography existed. But, but I definitely take the point, and I think, and I agree with the fact that photography is something that impulses the aggressive capitalism that we live in nowadays. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, very well, good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have a short break, five minutes, and then we we, we return for the second uh, uh, round of uh, uh, presentations. Okay, so five minutes. We'll be back. Vamos, é, vamos esperar mais um pouquinho ou começamos? Ah, Kevin is back. Okay. <laughs> uh, so we can start again our second part of 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 the section. This very intersection. So, uh, Marcus, you are going to present Erika, because Erika is our first uh, speaker. Okay? Can okay, you? okay. Anna, uh, I, I translated to English, but uh, I, I think it's better to put on chat in English. I, I read in Portuguese, okay? Okay, okay, I, I agree with you. <laughs> 
Calma, calma. Erika Zar é formada em filosofia, é doutora em história pela Unicamp, com estágio pós pós é, estágio de sanduíche na IS na é, é, Paris, na Paris, realizou pós-doutorado na no MAC USP, pesquisando fotografia humanista em seus diversos aspectos e dimensões políticas. É autora de, do livro Tempo de Guerra, Cultura Visual e Cultura Política nas Fotografias dos Fundadores da Agência Magno, tema de, seu, de, de sua tese de doutorado. É coautora com Yara Chavinato de Cultura Visual, Imagens na Modernidade, finalista do Prêmio Jabuti de 2019, e com a Costas, Mulheres Fotógrafas, Mulheres Fotografadas, Fotografia e Gênero na América Latina. E atualmente é fellow do programa conjunto do DFK Paris e Mias Casa de Velasque, Madrid. I, I will put you on chat. Ok, Erika. Thank you, thank you, Marcos. Thank you, Ana, for inviting me for this very interesting table today. It's very exciting to be here among you. And um, I'll, because of the time, I'll try to to, speak, to 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 go very fast through my presentation because I rather have more uh, debate after. But having said that, Anna, I will please ask you if you can let me know when there's ten minutes left because I always think to myself that I'll be quick and I always end up talking more than I should. So, <laughs> if you can please let me know. Uh, 10 minutes in advance, it will be very good. So let me uh, share my screen. I'll present your screen. Wait, wait, wait. Como é que eu faço, Ana? Era a window. Ah, achei, achei. Vocês estão vendo? Sim. Obrigada. Estamos, estamos. Tá. É, então, porque eu não estou vendo vocês. É, so, uh, to, today I'll present a little bit about my, uh, my latest research and... Um, it's been, uh, I've been uh, researching things related to these issues uh, that, I'll talk, that I'll talk about today for a few years now, since my uh, postdoc at the Museum of Contemporary Art in the University of Sao Paulo. And um, the starting point of uh, these varied uh, branches of research that I'm doing uh, the, the colloquia of uh, the Latin American photography colloquia. Uh, I, I, I want to say that the, the, the research is not exactly on the colloquia, it's not limited to the colloquia, but the colloquia uh, uh, raised some issues that I try to, um, to encompass in, in this research, and they are very interesting. Uh, there's interesting points of com that converge from uh, uh, into this uh, colloquia, and it's. I, I think it's a, a very. Um, uh, it was a, a, a very uh, important point in in Latin American photography historiography. So it's it's basically a, a starting point, as I said. Um, and uh, uh, it's uh, well. Let me just con uh, con uh, contextualize the colloquia so we we'll know a bit better what I'm talking about, and then I'll go back to to what I research in this. So there, uh, we had five editions of this uh, Latin American photography colloquia in 1978 and 81 in Mexico City, in 84 in Havana, 193 in Caracas, and 96 again in Mexico City. And um, the first two, which are the, I have the, the, the catalogs on the, on the photographs 
the in the slide. So the first two, uh, they were organized by the Mexican Council of Photography, uh, which was um, uh, this, this council was founded in 76 by Pedro Meyer, Lázaro Blanco Fuentes and Raquel Chibol. And the, the goals of this uh, Mexican Council of Photography, they, they stated goals, was to give uh, Mexican photography visibility, to foster photography education and professional, professionalization, to defend photographers' copyrights, and all of this by uh, uh, one of the, the, the means that they uh, thought about uh, achieving these goals was by bringing together Latin American photographers. Uh, so in this sense, the, 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 the Mexican Council is, uh, is born already with the idea of promoting this uh, Latin American uh, colloquia. Uh, so when they, they make the first one, they already call it the first uh, Latin American colloquia, colloquium. So uh, it was always supposed to be followed by others. Uh, and Pedro Meyer, in, in this, he is one of the, the most important uh, figures in this story. Uh, he was uh, one of the main organizers of the, the, these two first colloquia. And uh, according to him, uh, with uh, a lot of modesty, he says that Latin American photography was born in New York in 76. Uh, that's because he was in New York in 76 and he went there to, according to him, he was there to try to establish some dialogue uh, around his photographic practice. And he, he, he had a shock because he wasn't received by uh, the MoMA people. He tried to contact uh, people uh, uh, in the uh, MoMA uh, photography department and they they wasn't. They weren't very uh, interesting. Uh, interested in receiving him, so he went to see uh, Cornel Kappa, and Cornel in the ICP, the uh, International Center of Photography, uh, and Cornel Kappa uh, received him, and uh, but wasn't really interested in the what um, uh, Pedro Meyer wanted to show. Instead, he was asking uh, Pedro Meyer a lot of questions about Latin American photography, about who, uh, which photographers he knew, what photography he, he knew in Latin America. And Pedro Meyer says he was uh, ashamed to say that he couldn't answer that because he, he uh, also didn't know many photographers. So according to him, that was the, the, the beginning of this idea of the, the, the um, uh, the colloquia. So we can see through this uh, anecdote uh, that uh, at the same time the idea of the colloquia would be to better know to better know uh, Latin American photographic produ production between themselves. You know the the photographers that uh, didn't know exactly. And also when I was interviewing some Brazilian photographers, they would say to me that. Uh, Paris or New York, which uh, during that time in the late eight, late seven, late seventies and early eighties, uh, Paris or New York, which m they were much much closer than uh, Montevideo or Buenos Aires or any of the other uh, cities in, in Latin America. So there was really a lack of uh, um, knowledge about the Latin American production in that period. So you can see that um, uh, uh, behind this uh, anecdote told by Pedro Meyer, there was this idea of better known Latin American photography and also uh, to have Latin America uh, in, in, uh, better uh, recognized in the, the circuit of international photography. The, the, to have Latin American photography not subordinated to North American and European photography uh, because he felt that they they weren't very interested in uh, what he had to say when he was there and he, he, he four times he also complains that um, Latin America wouldn't have a, a, a proportional participation 
adequate, uh, an adequate uh, proportion and proportional uh, participation in the, the international circuit of photography. So there was the, uh, both these two ideas behind that. And um, of course, uh, this anecdote is his version of the story, but also the, uh, uh, and especially this, this, uh, uh, this idea that Latin American photography was born at that time. But uh, we, we have to say that the bibliography can't disagree very much on that because um, uh, 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 other scholars have shown that documents using the expression Latin American photography are very, very rare before the first Latin American colloquium. So we, they can see only, I, I think, a, a, a couple of times in the 50s, and then it disappears, and then it reappears uh, in the, during the colloquium, in, in, in especially in, in during the first colloquium in 78. So, um, uh, so going back to this uh, anecdote by Mayer, it's clear that there was from the beginning the idea of interna internationalizing Latin American photography, and that's my one of the main branches that I uh, I'm taking to research now, as I'll show you later. But what kind of Latin American photography? I mean, it, it would be this specific notion of Latin American photography formed around the colloquia. So you, we'll talk a little bit of, uh, later about this. So uh, going back to the history of the colloquia, it was inspired by the Rencontre d'Arles, uh, and the, the ICP in Nova York, in this, this idea of combining exhibition, education with or workshops you know, and debates. Uh, so Cornel Kappa and Lucien Clegg, uh, which was the, the, one of the founders of the ARL event, they were invited to, to the first colloquium, as well as Alan Porter, the editor of uh, the magazine Camera. And all of them would participate in spreading this photography in the years after the Latin American photography or the idea of Latin American photography uh, uh, present, uh, established by the colloquium uh, in the years after the, the first colloquium. And we will talk about this later also. And the, these two colloquia, the, uh, especially these first two, they have a uh, fundamental importance for the Latin America uh, historiography of photography uh, because they, pro they, they, they produced um, fundamental uh, documents for research. So this, they produced, first of all, a photographic collection uh, now under the custody of the Centro de la Imagen in Mexico uh, because the, the photographers would send, the, it, they opened uh, an open call for photographers to participate on that, on, on, on the colloquia, and the photographers would mail them their, their prints and they, would, they never return those photographs to the photographers. So they kept the, 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 these, pho pho the, these, these, these photographs and they, uh, this was the basis of the uh, photographic collection that the, the, it still exists uh, until today. And the second um, document they produced were the catalogs of the contemporary photogra photography exhibition, uh, exhibitions that they held during the, 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 the two first events. And the third, uh, the books uh, with the texts of the lectures that were given during these events. And these uh, ponencia, as they call it, they condensed many of the issues regarding professional practice and aesthetic and also politic uh, issues around Latin American photography. And they also uh, were uh, very important because they, they, uh, the, these events, they, they, um, they promoted contacts and exchanges so they generate a, seri a series of initiatives for the organization, the professional professionalization and the institutionalization of photography in many Latin American countries. 
And uh, finally, they helped to take Latin American photography to other continents and especially Europe. So uh, my research has been divided in these three overlaying parts uh, as outcomes of the colloquia. So um, in Brazil, uh, I uh, would say that uh, 73 Brazilian photographers were selected for the first uh, colloquium. And in the second, th there was a similar proportional number. And some of these photographers will become the most important names in history of contemporary Brazilian photography. At the same time, the photographic series that these photographers uh, sent to the colloquia and the, that they were exhi exhibited in the, the exhibitions they promoted would also become important part of the, the this photographer's careers and of uh, consequently to Brazilian uh, history of photography. And I've been interviewing some of these photographers that were part of this uh, colloquia. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, most of them from Brazil. So uh, one of them was Boris Kossoy. But Skosoy, he was different from the other ones that I'll talk about because he was one. Uh, he was invited to the colloquium. He wasn't. Uh, he didn't respond to uh, the open call, but he was invited to participate as as a guest. They had a, a few uh, guest uh, participants, and Boris Kosoy was one. He, uh, he was part of the guest exhibition where he exhibited photos from his uh, 1971 book Viaging pelo Fantástico, uh, which has a bit of surrealistic tone uh, uh, when uh, dealing with an everyday life that can be characterized as altered or exceptional. Uh, but uh, the, the presence of uh, Boris Kosoy there was much more due to his um, uh, research than to his photographic uh, production, because um, uh, he was he before the colloquium, the co first colloquium, he had recently published his book about Hercule Florence and his isolated invention of photography. Uh, so uh, Boris Kosoy, he was uh, one of the the, the researchers responsible to bring this um, uh, this uh, French emigrated to Brazil uh, inventor um, uh, back to, to to you know to, to back to be known because uh, uh, this Hercule Florence he had invented photography isolated in in Brazil and then. Um, he this uh, this this was lost in in history. So Boris Kosoy brought it back and uh, did a book about uh, wrote a book about that. And this book was uh, um, had been recently published. In, it was from 1976, uh, and it, it was it caused a bit of stir in the the colloquia because. Uh, we, it was a proof that Latin America, or Brazil specifically, but Latin America in general, had a, a right place in history of photography because we had our own inventor of the medium, albeit um, uh, isolated and, and never developed as, as the other inventions, but it was concomitant. And uh, so it put Latin America in a, in a place uh, together with uh, Europe and North America, and you know, as as a as a, I mean, um, uh, in, in importance, you know, in, in in history of photography, at least in the historic terms. The other photographer is Claudia Duja, and the first color she she is part of the first catalog, and it. Um, in this catalog, we see uh, different ways that photographers portray Latin American identity. And there are ethnic and social groups that would represent Latin American society, from popular, uh, popular Mexicans to Panamanian 
peasants to Peruvian Inca des descendants and the work of Claudia Duja with the Yanomami is part of that. Uh, uh, then it's Rosa Gauditano, the next photographer I interview and I work with her uh, a bit closer. Uh, she was uh, she was part of the first and the second uh, colloquia, and in, uh, the first colloquia she was just starting her career uh, as a photojournalist. She was uh, she was working to in, in the alternative press, the press that was uh, critical to the di dictatorship in Brazil. And she uh, also, she has, uh, she sent this essay about prost uh, prostitutes, which was really one of the first ever that she, she photographed. But after that, she would cover important uh, social movements in Brazil, such as labor union strikes, demonstration for women's rights, and also for uh, the first demonstrations of the black mov movement in Sao Paulo. Uh, and as a woman, she was able to have better access to some subjects that could be challenging, such as lesbians and the prostitutes, and also uh, to homeless children. Um, this first colloquia exhibited her series uh, uh, about uh, prostitutes in Sao Paulo that has a proximity with the hum humanist view of the urban or other and the approach to the social minorities and economical outsiders of uh, modern life. I'm sorry to be running so fast here, but I really want to have time for, for debate after. So uh, uh, other photographer that I interviewed, that I work with is Antonio Sargesi. So he, his documentary work pays attention to the social conditions uh, of Sao Paulo's anonymous people. It shows the precarious uh, conditions of the relationship between men and the inhabited environment. Uh, he was trained as an architect before he, he became a photographer. So he, uh, this series that he, he, he sent to the first colloquium really shows this relationship between workers and the, the, the place of work or between uh, uh, people inhabiting, inhabiting very uh, degraded spaces and uh, in the city center. And he is a, a, a curious case because after the colloquia, he would change, he would completely change his approach to photography. He would start uh, um, to, to develop a more uh, artistic, career, not so much documentary or not a uh, uh, photojournalist at all. He would, now he does um, uh, uh, landscape photography and it's very interesting that, that this, but back then he, he back then he was uh, into this social and documentary type of um, journalistic uh, essay. Uh, so, uh, together with the images, they sent small texts, uh, uh, like a letter to the, to the, to, to the committee, to the selection committee. Print little bits of these little sections of these, these letters that the photographers sent. The, the images don't have any um, byline or, or caption but they, they would come together with these little texts by the photographers. 10 minutes, Erika. Ai, obrigada, obrigada. Vou correr mais. So, uh, another one is uh, Pedro Vasquez. Uh, it shows, uh, uh, his images show a relationship between pedestrians in the big city and advertising images exposed in, on its walls and in, and its, in billboards, just like the, this photograph of a, a woman's hand, uh, 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 like all over the, the mouth of the, the men and just uh, to relate this with the, the, the period of dictatorship and censorship that we were having at that time. And also uh, I work with uh, Nair Benedito. Uh, she sent to the second colloquium uh, this a series she made uh, about the conditions to which juvenile detainees of the uh, state foundation for the welfare of the child, which we, we call Febem, were subjected. Uh, so these photographs show the marks of violence 
revealing uh, about indirectly the brutality of the military dictatorship as well. And here it's a, a bigger photograph of the children showing their scars uh, of uh, injuries made by the, the keepers. They, they, it, it was supposed to be an educational institute. And um, also, uh, finally, I would like to talk a little bit about Mutung Guram. So he sent to this uh, colloquium, the, to the second colloquium, a series portraying an indigenous wedding ceremony in Shingu that uh, was never uh, before seen by non-indigenous people. So he was the first one to photograph uh, in its entirety. So uh, as as it was the case with Andujar's work, in the context of the colloquia, as well as in the Brazilian political situation at that moment, the, the context of the, the dictatorship, the subject of the indigenous peoples could be regarded as a political one. So the, uh, the dictatorship understood Amazon as an empty place that needed to be civilized and used to promote progress and any um, similarities to the actual dictatorship we have or actual fascists we have in government is not coincidence. So it, it was a, 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 an act of resistance also to uh, during that the period of dictatorship to photograph indigenous people and to promote their rights as well. Um, so yeah, another photograph. And um, these interviews with Brazilian photographers were, were, that, that were part of the colloquia, they opened some research doors. So uh, for me, so this is one branch of what I did, uh, uh, especially uh, it led me to research uh, socially engaged photography uh, during, and its, uh, 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 its uh, role in resistance to di the dictatorship and especially uh, women photographers. So, because I'm, I'm also interested in, the, in, in gender issues in photography. So, uh, and the, the colloquia had a very good uh, uh, participation of, of women photographers. They were in large number there, which is surprising, but not, you know, uh, would be surprising today. I don't think that, that period it was that uh, different. But anyway, uh, but, but the colloquia also had repercussions in Latin America. So uh, I, I tried to research a little bit on the institutional aspect of these repercussions because we see that uh, immediately after the first and the second colloquia, there were um, uh, so a lot of institutions uh, around photography being founded in many countries in, in Latin America. So we had the, as I told you, the, the Mexican Council of the Photography being founded in 76 and they, they promoted the first colloquium in 78. And after that we had in 79 the uh, Argentinian um, Council of Photography founded by all these photographers and um, uh, uh, intellectuals that were part of the colloquia, the first colloquium. Uh, we had in, uh, the Venezuelan uh, Council of Photography, uh, which was founded by Paulo Casparini, which was also part of the colloquia and would host another colloquia uh, in uh, Caracas in 93. And we had in Brazil also the Núcleo de Fotografia da Funarte being founded by one of the founders or one of the, the main uh, pe pers person, people around it would be Pedro Vasquez, who was part also of the colloquia. And in 84, we had the foundation of Fototeca de Cuba, uh, which were, uh, was which was in the same year that they had the the, um, the colloquium uh, there in Havana. Um, and these, all these institutionalizations, uh, 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 the, this founding of institutions that would promote and host photography are, are intertwined with the colloquium and um, 
I, I it's just uh, I have to say that the the bibliography on that is 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 developed. We have been um, uh, there, there, there's have there's been some studies. Uh, both about the colloquia and about this institutionalization, which is amazing that the historiography is starting to, to take a look on that uh, with more uh, depth uh, lately. And uh, we had like uh, on the colloquia, we had some um, dissertations being uh, published lately uh, uh, and some research being conducted in, in Mexico as well. Uh, and uh, this, institution, institution, the, this process of institutionalization uh, may, in Brazil, mainly uh, we can uh, look at uh, Ana Mawaj's uh, research, which is uh, uh, one of the main uh, uh, references in this aspect, but they are all intertwined. So what I'm uh, really doing right now is the uh, this uh, to, uh, a bit of research uh, on how this colloquia impacted uh, the, the, the transits and the cultural um, exchanges between Latin America and Europe. This is my co current research. So uh, we see that just after the the first two colloquia, we had a lot of uh, events around Latin American photography happening here in Europe, especially uh, through the collection formed by these first two colloquia. They were basis for this series of event events in Europe in the decade in the during the decade of 1980. Uh, so the first one I wanted to talk was photography Venice in 79 and um, it had a short version of uh, Echo in Latin America which was the first uh, uh, exhibition on contemporary photography uh, in the, the first colloquium and the cat catalog of this photograph Venice has a chapter on Latin American exhibition with an English version of the text that Raquel Chibol had presented in her uh, talk during the symposium of the first colloquium, as well as 13 uh, pho photographs, including one of Boris Kosoy. Uh, this same exhibition that was in Venice uh, was part of the 79 Arle Festival as well. Uh, remembering that Luc Lucien Clerc uh, participated in the first colloquium. Then in um, 81, there was this big exhibition in the Kunsthaus in Zurich, curated by uh, Erika Billeter. She was also responsible for the catalog and the catalog included texts by Boris Kosoy, Alicia D'Amico and Maria Mari Eugenia Haya, which had taken uh, important part in the first colloquium. And a considerable number of contemporary photographers presented by Billet uh, also participated in the first colloquium issue in Latin America. Um, and after Zurich, this exhibition traveled to West Berlin and it was part of the Horizonte 82 America Latina Fair. Uh, and also uh, in Paris, we had La Photographie in America Latina, which is curated by Alan Sayag, and it was held by the Georges Pompidou Centre in 1982. It was assembled uh, from the, 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 the first colloquia, uh, at the first and second colloquia collection. Um, um, just to finish, then, um, like uh, all uh, the, the events in Mexico, these European exhibitions, they remain important sources for the historian. And uh, my main uh, uh, questions would be uh, which kind of photography was uh, portrayed in these exhibitions. And also I'm researching the uh, camera magazine, how Latin American photography was portrayed in, in the magazine during the same period. 
because there's a, a question of Latin American identity and the creation of a specific notion of what Latin American photography would be, which was legitimated by these institutional spaces in Europe. So uh, I'm sorry to have gone through it very fast, but it's more, uh, I've been, these are more or less my research questions. Great, Eric. Great. Very good. Very, Very good. good. Thank you. So. Thank you, Erica, for your communication. Yeah. So we go to the next communication with Marcos. Marcos de Brum Lopes é doutor em História Social pela Universidade Federal Fluminense. Atuou como pesquisador do Serviço de Patrimônio Histórico, Artístico e Cultural da Secretaria Municipal de Cultura de Teresópolis entre 2009 e 2010. Desde 2010, é historiador e técnico em assuntos culturais do Museu Casas de Benjamin Constant, o Ibram, além de pesquisador associado do Laboratório Historial Imagem, o Laboy, da UF, foi, 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 foi Fulbright Scholar and Residence na Spoken Community College entre 2015 e 2016, foi professor substituto de teoria do Departamento de História da UF em 2017 e atualmente professor visitante no Departamento de História da UFMG. Marcos, esse contigo. The words is... Obrigado, Marcos. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me today to be here, although virtually. Uh, I'm very glad to share this panel with uh, Erica and uh, Kevin. And my, my, my speech today is called Dead Capital, Profit Capital, Private Photographs Becoming Public. Uh, so when I decided to name my presentation this way, I was thinking of a very specific document I found uh, in my research. Uh, I'll explain more later. But then I was developing my ideas and it led me to a whole different territory. In the end, we're going to take that big dive or big jump Towards, uh, towards the future, uh, as I usually do in my, in my speeches, I like to play uh, like with uh, some anachronism uh, in a positive way, I guess, to engage with what the pictures uh, show us about the past and what related pictures can show us in our present, uh, in our political present, uh, present specifically. So let me just share my, my uh, slides here, my PowerPoint. I hope it works. I am very glad that Erica mentioned the, the idea of Latin America and uh, the idea of a Latin American identity. And with the pictures of, uh, made by Milton Guran, especially with that quotation uh, she gave, us about uh, the hinterland of Brazil being an empty space and a place to be developed, this idea will play a major role in what I have to say today. So um, I have to share a window, correct? Yes. By the end correct. of my presentation, I have a very small and fast video. So if the audio, if the sound does not come uh, through for you, just let me know and I'll try another way. Can you see it? Yes. Good. You have now to project it. Yes. yes. Perfect. So I'm going to read the most part of it. Just uh, not to lose track of time. So uh, the introduction of my speech is based mainly uh, in what Kevin shared with us. So I'm, I'm happy to skip this first part. So keep, keep uh, Kevin's speech fresh in your minds because I would uh, talk a little bit about uh, that same introduction of the book he published with Daniel James, which is remarkably good. So, um, the main goal of this speech is to consider photographs as exchangeable goods. It is certainly not a new idea. In fact, 
it is as old as the first photographs ever taken because as objects, photographs are bound to be traded for any other thing. Uh, many pictures are not made to be exchanged in, in a capitalist sense, but they always offer something to the observer who returns the gesture with passion, hatred, shame, love, anguish, or indifference. Uh, so by the same token, we can resist the capitalist trade of life using photographs. Perhaps the same pictures can serve both ends. It will depend on how one approaches the image, if one is willing to read and look at them against the grain. Uh, on another level, photographs hardly ever or never escape the capitalist system. Or better put, they don't, ex they don't escape it easily. Although they might be employed counter-hegemonically in what is named by Ana Maria Mawad uh, as photography engajada or engaged photography or concerned photography, photographs are a product of an apparatus fabricated by companies sold in the market both for professional and amateur users. The fact that a picture made by a camera exists testify for the maintenance of this industry. Uh, so let me just skip this part, not to be redundant. So the case I bring to you today is far less grandiose than the iconic projects of documentation or exhibition, like the Family of Man or the Farm Security Administration. It actually comes from an individual trying to find his way in Brazil after immigrating from Austria uh, in the 1920s. So this, uh, this man was named Mario Baldi. He was a photographer uh, that has uh, been my, my companion for almost uh, 15 years. Although he died in, in 1957, I've been researching his life and his archive uh, for quite, quite a, some time now. So he arrived in Brazil in 1921 and he started to make pictures of local populations and landscapes. Uh, landscapes, yeah. He worked in farms and saved some cash to buy photographic equipment and to travel through the land. In 1925, he accidentally met a prince Pedro de Orleans e Bragança, grandson of the former Brazilian emperor, took advantage of the withdrawal of the Republican banishment decree and traveled back to Brazil. Mario Baldi offered his, his services to the prince who hired him as a valet. Because of his photographic skills and being the prince himself, a practitioner of the art, Baldi was promoted to official photographer of Pedro's expeditions. For the first time, the immigrant enjoyed stability and a salary paid for what he actually wanted to do in Brazil, that is to make pictures of his experiences. In 1928, the photographer went back to Europe following, following his patron. The next year arrived with a major economic crisis, 1929, and generalized unemployment. Nazi fascism spreading in Europe and a marriage to an Austrian girl made him resign to move back to Brazil. It was not easy, but they eventually made it in 1934. Mario was promised a job to film the Catholic mission among the Bororo people in a region of forests, farms, and small villages. He was told that he could easily make a living there as a photographer. It was not true. In 1934, he wrote to Hippolyte Chauvelon, a priest who had joined him and Prince Pedro in the uh, 1920s expeditions, and who encouraged him to make the film among the Bororo. So this is the letter he wrote to Hippolyte Chauvelon and from which I took this idea of dead capital and uh, profit capital. And he says this, and I quote, 
My first and foremost wish is to work with photography and cinematography in connection with journalism and publishing. I eagerly wish to edit a book illustrated with my photographs taken during my travels with the Prince Dom Pedro. I suppose it would be very successful here, but I can't find a way of doing it. It lacks me the connections with influential people. I mean, the folks in the book market, journalists, editors, etc., of this country. I've been making such good and sharp photographs. At the same time, artistic and typical, which would very much please the prince and yourself. But what's the value of all this? It is for the time being dead capital, lacking the push of the right person to be turned into profit capital for me. I'm sure I'd be successful. I am so sure that I've been thinking about it during the nights. And when it comes to my mind, I feel like screaming of pain and sorrow to find a way to carry on with this plan. The condition I find myself in is terrible and I must find a way out. So that's what he says to his friend. So when I read this letter for the first time, the suffering and a bit of anger for, for frustrated expectations grabbed my attention. It wasn't after some time in another readings that the idea of dead capital and profit capital stood out to me. That's the way Baldi uses his words in Portuguese, a language he was then trying to master, capital lucro. We would say capital de lucro or só lucro. Uh, so this prosaic situation and sincere words describe what most of the social histories of photography emphasize. An author, producer, a photographic practice responding to a demand and organizing a work relation, in this case, the work relation between the prince and the hired photographer. The formation of an archive, the willingness to publicize it, but it lacked what by the end of the day mattered most, circulation. Uh, so uh, I was reminded by uh, that article I was mentioning by John Tech that this idea of currency applies more or less to this case because Baldi's picture uh, lacked this kind of currency, this kind of circulation that would turn this dead capital, like sitting in the archive, his private archive, to profit capital, that is, his private uh, pictures becoming, becoming public in a book or in the magazines. Uh, so because Baldi's pictures lacked it, uh, in this case, following Marx, photographs were just like pearls, gold or diamonds. Nobody has ever found the exchange value in the silver salts. So that's uh, uh, an argument of Marx in the capital, uh, talking about gold and, and pearls, I guess. That exchange value is something that culture produces. It's not inside the, the chemicals, right? Uh, so I'm joking with the silver salts uh, about it. A few years later, Mario Baldi managed to sell his pictures to illustrated magazines of Rio de Janeiro and later to one of the largest press companies in the city uh, called Anoichi. The photographs showed his former aristocratic patron with his family chatting, chatting with uh, the Karaja people, eating large bananas, hunting beasts, and fixing broken cars in the middle of marshes, deserts, and forests. Photographs printed in magazines functioned like windows to the world. Because they were more like open passages than solid objects, they belonged to nobody, and precisely because of it, could be appropriated by any reader or viewer. From the standpoint of law, and I know this is very far from settled, the pictures could be property of the men and women that produced them, but as soon as they sold them to papers, those goods entered the public visual circuit. circuit. By public, I mean public exposure achieved by the possibility of replication typical of mass-produced magazines. Uh, in this sense, this, the pictures had to be sold and bought again, 
not as negative or, or gelatin prints, but as pictures alongside verbal narratives and advertisements. Oops, sorry. Following Mario Baldi's, Baldi's reasoning, his dead capital was slowly turning into profitable capital or profit capital, as as he, he said. I don't I don't really know how much money he made with these pictures. Uh, were the photo essays worth the sacrifices made? Was the public eager to visualize the Brazilian hinterlands, the imperial visitor captured in film by his private photographer? or the indigenous population subjected to religious rule. So what we are seeing here are the Bororo people that were living uh, inside a Catholic mission. You, you can see the clothes that was were introduced by the, the European priests among the Bororo people. This is from 1934 and 1935, these pictures. And a couple of other pictures of mining, gold mining, uh, diamond actually, diamond uh, uh, mining. Uh, okay. The magazines here and there suggested that the photographer emerged as a kind of authorized eye for the public, a surrogate observer indispensable for a printed visual culture. In his research about the photography of crisis during the Republic of Weimar, Daniel Magillo, or Magillo documented the same trend in Europe around the same time. Between the public and the world, there, was, there were the magazines and the photographers whose portraits also appeared as pictures in the papers, as is, it's the case here with uh, this particular photographer. I tried to document the same process in the case of Mario Baldi. My aim was to go through those windows to the world, but at the same time to treat the pictures as objects, as goods ready to be traded, as layers of meaning, as opaque three-dimensional three cubes, not as bidimensional squares or rectangles, weird as the idea may seem. A simple way to do it is to turn the pictures around. On the backs of pictures, I found some clues to the position the photographer claimed to hold, as well as indicators of how the press could treat the images uh, at the expense of the author as producer, many times. Authors and agencies claimed ownership and credit for the images with overlapping stamps. You can see here the Yurumi, I will explain what that is later, and uh, Below the Yurumi stamp, which is a red one, you can see the Black Star uh, stamp. We, Black Star was a huge uh, New Yorker agent, uh, photo agency back in the day. Uh, it was created, I guess, in, at, in the same year that the Life magazine appeared. So it was, it was like, an, uh, it is an iconic uh, photo agency in the history of photography. So uh, somehow, Baldi managed to uh, sell also his pictures or try to do so. At least it circulated among these, uh, these agencies and being Black Star, one of them. Uh, where are we? Okay, overlapping stamps like we see here. While magazines asserted that they were publishing pictures based on a friendly understanding with the photographer, as was the case with Baldi in 35 and 37, one can only imagine what these friendly agreements might have been with give and takes, negotiations, claims of ownerships as attested by the many stamp marks, the amount of work invested in a single frame or in a series of frames designed to tell a story, an effort that made the authors beg not to be forgotten, which is what we see here. So Yurumi was a photo agents create, agency created by Mario Baud and Harold Schutz, who was also a German photographer uh, working in Brazil. Then Harold Schutz would move to Sao Paulo to work uh, especially with ethnographic uh, photography, uh, what Baud also did. So what they are saying here is don't forget or forget as not a uh, reportage of Mario Baud and Harold Schutz. Please give us credit for it, do not forget. 
uh, it goes without saying that my arguments lack an important part of the process, uh, the subjects of the pictures, the photographed people, the indigenous populations represented, who certainly haven't profited at all from the trading of their own images. So the question, uh, one of the questions actually to be asked is, who really profits uh, with the transformation of dead capital? We hardly ever or never see the return of this value to the original owners of the pictures, that is the owners of the bodies depicted in the photographs. After the capture by the photographic frame, who actually possesses the pictures? So around 37, Baudi created this agency uh, called Yurumi, which is uh, a word from the Tupi language for Tamanduá. And I forgot how to translate that into English, but it's, it's a tropical uh, animal. Okay. <clears throat> One of the photo essays published by Urumi, by Harold Schultz and Mario Baldi deserves a closer look. So this is my first jump to another, uh, not another time because it was quite uh, at the same decade, but to, uh, uh, I don't know, another level of, of, of uh, argument. So my account here is very much inspired by the arguments in capitalism and the camera, which Kevin just shared with us uh, earlier. In the 1930s, in this photo essay, uh, it, uh, this story is told. In the 1930s, a man purchased a small estate in the city of São, São João del Rey, in Minas Gerais. The house came along and an unexpected bonus. Baldin Schultz described the situation as follows, and I quote, The value of the event exposed by this reportage doesn't come only from its material significance. It is impressive mainly as a unique demonstration of the gold richness that spreads itself through large portions of the Brazilian territory. This episode has a picturesque note with a powerful symbolic radiance. A modest citizen of the city of São João del Rey in the state of Minas Gerais acquired a beautiful house in exchange of a tiny amount of three contos de reis, which was the, the, the money at the time. And he found a rich gold mine in the backyard. The yield offered a profit beyond all expectations. He sought for the help of two comrades and began to extract an extraordinary income. The gold emerged easily and abundantly. And the quote... Marcos, 10 minutes, tá? Okay. Obrigado, thank you. Not unusual in that region of Brazil, the gold mine made a neat subject for an illustrated magazine. The, photo the, the photographers documented the house, framing it with the city's landscape. Uh, then, the pen then they penetrated the earth down to the gold mine in which the workers felt a cold and chilly wind coming from what was later described as a deep abyss. Back again to the surface, they photographed the mine workers steering the moody water in the bateias, large wooden dishes to wash the dirt where the gold is supposedly hidden. This documentation by Baldi and Schultz never caught my attention beyond the unexpectedness of the event itself. But uh, after I read the, the essays on capitalism, the camera and extraction, I was quite uh, intrigued by it. And so I want to use this, uh, this photo essay just as a trampoline or a platform to observe the easiness and the naturalism with which the common sense and the public treat and the press for that matter and the press uh, treat the extraction of goods of riches of capital from the underground this is the powerful symbolic radiance mentioned by the authors just like the radiance of the diffuse light would give form to, a, to photographs only if the shutter worked properly 
the gold is buried beneath the surface waiting to be found. It will remain a dead capital until it's discovered. Of course, it is a fantasy as Marx warned us a long time ago. There is no use in knowing where it is and not digging for it. To transform it in the culture of capitalism, to expose it to a public willing to pay for it, that is to customers. For Baldi, there were uh, no use in his photographs while they sat or lay dead in his archive. The exposure of the gold mine pictures in a mass printed magazine functions as a meta narrative of his idea of dead and profitable capital. And the pictures are meta pictures of the same process. His photographs started to emerge and with them, the author producer. Uh, coming to an end here, wrapping up. Uh, the second lesson to be learned derives from the same naturalism with which Brazilian society treats its territory. So to extract uh, riches and goods and, and gold, for that matter, from the land uh, also means to, to, to uh, extract the native populations that were living uh, in this same territory. Baldi himself gave a good deal of thinking to this uh, subject, to this matter, to this issue. Uh, he would ask himself, who represents the Brazilian land? In 1950, he affirmed, our indigenous siblings are the ones entitled to this immense territory and fully represent Brazil. Is that so? Or all portions of land should be subjected to capitalist appropriation? Are the indigenous populations to be heard in this discussion? Do they really have rights over the land and what lays underneath it? Or are all the citizens of this country to be given the same chance and opportunity that fill that uh, lucky man's pocket in expense of the protected indigenous lands? By now, a big jump ahead to the future will reach the 21st century and the social media that apparently makes public all that was once private, apparently, right? <laughs> in, the context, in the context of the rights to own a land and its riches, the stakes are still very high for the indigenous populations. Descendants of those that were the principal subjects of Mario Baldi's uh, photography during his career. That's precisely what our Supreme Court is judging at this very moment. That is the right of the indigenous people, peoples to occupy their ancestral lands. For several weeks now, they are protesting, resisting and speaking their minds on the matter alongside popular movements engaged in the same battle against powerful mining organizations and criminal loggers. So I'm gonna leave you with uh, these extremely beautiful pictures by Ricardo Stuckert. Uh, he photographed the powerful uh, Quarup ritual in Mato Grosso. And uh, in one particular photo, one particular photo suggests, suggests that when one stands on the ground, the shadows of performative bodies redesign and reoccupy the land. I'm talking about this uh, picture on the left. Another picture shows the photograph, the photograph as picture makers. You can see uh, on the background here, uh, the, the, the man with the cell phones, the smartphones making picture as, pictures as well. Many other groups are symbolically gathering in the capital of the country, Brasilia. Some say it's a capital of corruption, evil and misgovernance. This is the curse of Brasilia, born out of nowhere to shine bright with its white buildings, whose radiance is captured in iconic photographs, like the ones by uh, Marcel Gautreau, and to be a symbol also of failure and an arena of struggles. 
So our effort now is to look at these pictures, static and moving ones. These public photographs, their producers, who won't claim ownership beyond the credit of having pushed the button, the performances of bodies inside of them, and try to over, overcome the idea of debt and profitable capital, to go beyond appropriative relationships with people and land to prevent that Brasilia witnesses one more time a magnificent failure, to prevent that in the name of turning into profit what was once dead capital, Brasilia becomes a capital of death. So with this, I end, and I just want to, to play this, uh, this one minute video. If the, the, the sound doesn't come through, please let me know. I, I've translated uh, to Kevin and to our other international uh, guests. Uh, what is being said here. Uh, let's see if it works. Nesse momento, nós somente reviu mulheres presentes nesse lugar. Nós sentimos milhares de forças agindo também nesse lugar. Muita gente se pergunta aonde o Brasil começa. Será que é mesmo aqui em Brasília? Eu espero poder ter igualdade social. Ou será que é o nosso território do povo tradicional? O território é cheio de ciência. O limite de uma terra está em nossa consciência. Nós precisamos, sim, lutar pela verdadeira liberdade. Porque não existe democracia sem a demarcação de nossos territórios em si. Nós fazemos aqui presente porque nós entendemos que mesmo que tente nos quebrar, nós somos povo da diversidade. E nem a necessidade pode ser matada por nenhum projeto político. Nenhum projeto político é capaz de enterrar o povo que vive com um que vive com um que vive Very good, Marcos. Very good. So, uh, could you listen to the audio? Yes, yes, yes. It was okay. perfect. Yes. Nice. Perfect. So well, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Marcos. And uh, the next, we'll start the questions of the public from the public and comments too. I, I have some commentaries uh, to start. Uh, I, 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 I want to congratulate both of you. Uh, Erika, I, I think it's very important, your research, because uh, uh, we've been uh, uh, researching in Brazil, and I think this connection uh, with Latin America, and the way you, 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 you quoted Pedro Maia, it's very important, because actually, I agree, we must agree with him. Uh, without uh, giving the name of Latin American photography, we won't have uh, 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 actually a uh, Latin American photography because it's all spread out and uh, you have the photo club the, the, the photo club movement you have uh, different and all separated one and then you get all together and you name it Latin American photography. It was the first time I was thinking about it. I have the books here about uh, in America Latina and so on. But I would like to, to, to ask you uh, how we can uh, connect this with the generation phenomenon, because all this, uh, you have different generations here. Uh, uh, Rosa Galditano, was, she's younger than Nay Benedicto, but a generation in terms of shared experience, I, I'm addressing this concept. But also, uh, parallel to this movements to recognize a kind of uh, 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 art photography in uh, uh, Brazil or Latin America as you uh, exhibit uh, photojournalism practice, how you connect this, I know you, you know about this movement, with the independent, independent agents movement where photography became uh, a kind of, of uh, uh, possibility to create a, 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 a visual public space in terms of 
the, the, the struggle for, for democratization, not just in Brazil, but he, 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 you have this in Argentina, in Uruguay, and also in Mexico. Uh, 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 in, in 1979, uh, the, the, the Olympic Games there and all the, 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 the shooting you have the, in, the, in the plus of uh, uh, three uh, races. And the, this uh, photograph production is very important uh, for, for the, the, the th third argument of Kevin, because this kind of photograph or photographic practice, as I, I, I'd rather name it, create public. Create public in terms of uh, commitment, in terms of, 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 of social movement, in terms of, uh, 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 of, of create, uh, not just a creating a conception, but a creating a public concerned space for democratic democratic practice i would like to 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 uh, to uh, uh especially because you have this kind of internationalization in it for for also brazilian and latin american it's very important especially because we are at that moment we are uh, fighting against dictatorship so this is very important in terms of uh, 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 parading these images out of uh, Latin American countries. So it has a political perspective that I would like to stress in your uh, presentation. Also, uh, I I'd like to address a question to Marcos because I think it's very important uh, the way you deal with this uh, two times the afterlives of images, not just the afterlife of images, but a kind of collective biography of these images. Because I think a uh, uh, committed uh, uh, photography or committed photographic practice has to do with the invention of Brazil. Has to do, not a Brazilian identity, but multiples of uh, Brazils that uh, appears in these images, and I think the way you 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 study Baudi's photograph is very very uh, open-minded in terms of uh, 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 questioning these photographs not in in its own context, but bringing these images uh, towards the future. So you 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 give life to these images. So I think it's very interesting the way, and, I, and Bruno is here, Bruno works with, with archives, and I think the way the archives uh, jump, the, the images pop up from the archives and, 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 and glue in the, the, the walls of the, the galleries and became an, 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 a different narratives. I think it's, it's really important. And I have a, 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 a Kevin, uh, a, not a, a question, but a provocation. I can see, in, 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 and I would like to, to know how you solve or not solve, but how you dealt with this antinomy that I can find uh, between capitalism as consumption and photograph as autonomy or uh, 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 bringing autonomy to the public and creating a real uh, 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 a shared uh, public uh, space. I think there is an antinomy. Uh, and I, I would like to, to, to hear a, li a little bit more. I know we, we, we are investing in time, but I think the, the, this, this, this presentation was so, so provocative that I'd like to, to, to listen a little bit more about this. Do you understand the question about, okay? Ana Clara, do you, can you... Hi, Erica. Uh, Erica, você não é, <laughs> você não é estrangeira. Uh, I love your research. I thought that was very passionate and was fascinating. I didn't know you were, you were hearing me. Yeah, uh, I didn't know many of these photographs, 
photographers, but I'm thinking about the, you said that you did an interview with them, right? And how do you use this material? Because as an anthropologist, I was thinking, how do you use this material in your research, in your, it's a, it's a postdoc, right? Yeah, so how you use that in your, in your work and how it was to know these people and to have all these context about their work. I was very interested in that. Could you tell me a little bit about it? Okay. So I was um, about to, to ask Erica the same um, question, or not the same question, but a related question about uh, uh, the connections of your research to oral history and what are the strategies of these interviews? Are they like, uh, 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 story of life and then uh, focusing then on the photographic uh, work. I'm just curious how you, you circulate in this uh, photography, history of photography and social history and oral history. Marcos, I, I, I think that uh, you start the, the answers. Uh, so next, Erica, the final Kevin. Okay. Okay, no problem. Oh, so the afterlives of images. Yes, this is a very uh, Warburgian uh, approach, which I like. Uh, the migration of images, it's very uh, Michio, uh, you know, I like him uh, very much. Uh, it is very uh, Ariela Azulé that I learned today that we pronounce Azulé. I would say Azulai, but that's okay. <laughs> Uh, because uh, the image is the picture or the photograph is uh, that thing that belongs to no one and uh, the, the, the meaning is actually not uh, fixed forever, right? And then uh, this is also a strategy for me not to, to fall in the illusion that the photographer uh, tried to sell to posterity because uh, about it was uh, very much a uh, feud with himself you know uh, he was not a phenomenal or extraordinary uh, a picture maker although he had his his highlights but he was very proud of being the photographer of the prince uh, of being the photographer during the first world war he was very proud of being accepted by the indigenous populations as someone uh, authorized to make their pictures, uh, to transform their bodies into pictures. This is very nice, very interesting to explore, but uh, uh, to, to, to look at these pictures from, a, from different standpoints, not only the photographers, uh, it was a strategy for me not to, to, to fall in that, into that uh, illusion, uh, uh, which Bourdieu would call the biographical uh, illusions uh, somehow, some, somewhat in that dire direction. So uh, yes, I try to, to connect these, uh, these pictures with uh, more recent or contemporary images because when we made put up an exhibition, you might remember that on, uh, in Arquivo Nacional with the Bororo pictures, we interviewed the Bororo people uh, nowadays about these Baudis pictures, and they connected themselves directly with that images. They said, uh, I'm, we are seeing here uh, stuff that we, we do not do anymore, material we don't have, so uh, it, these pictures uh, make us uh, feel uh, feel saudade of ourselves. They're like, I am missing myself looking at these pictures. So this is, uh, this is a, a real connection, like, right? An object, objective connection these people are making with these ancient or, or old pictures. So why not explore them today? So this is uh, the main idea. And uh, the fact that Bauder himself used that word, uh, capital, uh, dead capital in the archive and profit, profit capital when it circulates, it, it, it's very easy. I, I am very thankful to him, actually, that he wrote this down because uh, it, it allows us to, to make these connections to currency, uh, to uh, circulation, to public, because public is not the same as audience. Magazines uh, have 
audience. Uh, archives have audience. Uh, the researchers are the audience of archives mainly, right? We are, uh, but not precisely audience, but I think it's not the same. Public uh, in, a, in a sense of, uh, of a concerned public, as you put it uh, earlier, uh, it's something different. It's not just expectation. It's like expectation, but also uh, action, right? So uh, these uh, these images, maybe they had their public back in the day. Uh, it was supposed to steer uh, support from the population, the urban population, for this movement of the modern Brazil advancing. Uh, over the, this, this lands, this uh, nobody's lands. Uh, but now uh, they don't serve this purpose anymore. They shouldn't, right? And, and that's the place, the, the new place I want to put these pictures uh, to engage the public with these new pictures of uh, Ricardo Stuckert, for example, or the pictures that the indigenous populations are, are making of themselves in Brasilia. So that's the, 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 the play of words in dead capital and capital of death, which is something we, we should prevent, I guess. Erica? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, Anna, you are absolutely right. There is a generation uh, view on that. Uh, they are all, as I, I said in the beginning, they, uh, most of these uh, Brazilian photographers who were part of the both the, the first and second colloquia, they were in the beginning of their careers and most of them were uh, working for the, the uh, alternative press and uh, were part of the of, uh, a, a, a small um, agencies. The, uh, most of them uh, founded their own agencies. They were part of their own a small agencies and didn't work for the main press. Um, and uh, a large number of them also were uh, politically and socially engaged. And I think that um, even though they don't, they don't belong uh, to the same age range, you are right, they are the same generation of photographers in Brazil. And um, I think that, of course, the, the, the ones I selected to study, I have a, a bias, you know, I, did, uh, I, I, I had some criteria to select them. Uh, first of all, the ones who were alive, and then the ones who continue uh, uh, to build their careers, and the ones that I could reach to, and I, I, I wanted to have the same number of men and women, and I have to, I wanted to have uh, outside of the main axis of Sao Paulo in Rio. So I had some other interviews that I didn't talk about, but uh, today, but also. Um, there, there's a, a, a certain bias that, a, 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 a towards the uh, socially engaged photography. So that I, I, I want, I, but, but having said that, we can see the main uh, participants, the, 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 the large, the, the biggest number of participants were uh, more or less the same um, and, uh, in the same this same category of photographers and I think it has to do m more with the, the criteria of selection for the um, the, the, the colloquia how the, they they wrote the, the call for, for photographs how they wrote the, the and how they wrote the criteria which with which they would select the, the, the photographers. So it, it, that's when uh, that's the first step towards uh, identifying uh, an idea of la what Latin American photography would be for these photographers and how it circulated in Europe. So if you if you if you uh, read Erika Billeter on that book that she wrote, for her there's only humanist photography in Latin America. You know, and only document doc, doc, documentary photography. 
she says there's no artistic photography in Latin America, which is obviously nonsense. But I mean, the what the idea of uh, I think the Pedro Meyer's idea was also uh, the idea of the colloquium was also to to foster. Uh, institutionalization and professional, professionalization of photography. So they were uh, 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 centered on photojournalism. They were centered on uh, um, also they talked a lot about um, uh, practical issues such as um, uh, copyrights and how to uh, the, the rights of the the uh, uh, um, the the photographer the the uh, that is not associated to how do you say the word I forgot I, I'm so sorry I I'm even forgetting Portuguese I will end up mute because I I haven't get better in English I can't speak French uh, you know very well and now for for uh, Portuguese is vanishing from my head. So, and also at DFK, where I'm doing my research here, they are German center, so they speak German among themselves. So it's it's frying my my brain. So I'm so sorry. Anyway, the, <laughs> the the this individual photographers who were not part of the big media and the, the big corporations, so they uh, uh what was I saying. Uh, they were independent in terms of of uh, producing their their photographs. Yeah, yeah. And so exactly. So they they had a lot of ponencias around the, the 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 rights of the independent photographers. And you know, Anna, how this generation after they came back from the first colloquia, they started discussing these things here in Brazil as well. So they were discussing Rosa and Ayir, they were they were forming Milton, they were forming union uh, photojournalist photojournalism you labor unions. They were talking about the the minimum payment for 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 they were talking all about uh, about a uh, copyright as well. So this was uh, uh, one of the uh, this was why I think uh, the the colloquium was t um, um, centered around photojournalism as well. But it had it has repercussions because it, it sent to Europe and and to elsewhere because it was also it, it went as far as Australia. Australia had a, an exhibition on Latin American photography. I think it was. 84 or 86, I have the catalog. Of course, in Texas as well, they had uh, in PhotoFest in the 80s, uh, all related to Cornel Kappa and to the um, in Pedro Meyer. So it is a, a broader secret, you know, and it, they took this, photo, this documentary photography with humanist, uh, 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 it's not humanist photography, of course, because that would be doing like uh, Erika Bileta did. That would be putting Latin American production inside a, a, a North, North America, Europe axis um, framework. So, uh, but it is humanist inspired. It has relations to humanism in the sense of this social engaged documentary. So, um, it was this photography that went abroad and to change and we see in the late 80s uh, early 90s uh, when this starts to to change uh, just um, and 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 uh, then uh, what would you call artist oriented photography i don't like to to you know to compartmentalize compartmentalize or to make these distinguishings just but anyway it would be more towards artistic production then it would uh, prevail uh, after the, the the mid 80s but and then it was this idea of, uh, of uh, documentary of photojournalism and which is uh, uh, it is totally related to this generation in Brazil and the, this generation of engaged photographers as well that were actively 
uh, uh, working against dictatorship and they were an uh, uh, important part in overcoming and, uh, dictatorship and re-democratization re re uh, after the dictatorship. And uh, Ana Clara and Marcos about the interviews, yes, I, well, I'm not a oral historian, I don't have any background in oral history, I just went there and talked to them and asked them questions. And I, I haven't published these interviews, but I would love to. I had a book proposal going on, but I'm not sure if I'll be able to make it because life is hectic and it's, uh, you know, but <laughs> it was, uh, anyway, I have them, I have them translated and I wish I can uh, do something with them soon rather than later, but uh, they were the, the starting point for my, um, for my uh, research on Brazilian photography and and they, the the kind of uh, issues they raise when they are talking about this. Well, most of them don't remember anything about the colloquia. Most of them <laughs> can't help very much with that. But they they have some stuff that they bring up that uh, really be, where it was where I build up my. Uh, my research on all of this. So yeah, mainly this idea that Brazil was totally cut from Latin America, because the starting point has to be the understanding that Latin America is a, a political concept. It's not given, it's not, you know, ge ge geographical, it's not, although geographic Ge geography is political, but it's not, you know, God given. It's something that was historically built. So, uh, and then um, uh, they, they would say that during the dictatorship, we were completely cut from, from, Latin, from the rest of Latin America. And then um, uh, it would be because it would be a political also, of course, uh, 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 something that was uh, coming from the dictatorship. And, uh, yeah, that was one of the things that came from the interviews. I mean, I, I just, I, I, I get the, 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 the I, I, I like get, it's uh, uh, intertwined, it was... Uh, like a main source for you, the interviews? Yeah, it's one of the main sources, it yeah. definitely is, yes. Yeah. Kevin, you are, do you want to... Uh, sure, I really enjoyed the presentations by Erica and Marcos. They were, um, yeah, they were awesome. I was, um, I was thinking to go back to to Anna's question about this antinomy between what we might call privatization and autonomy. Uh, yeah, I think it's there, and I would say almost all of the photographs in the world. Uh, work toward privatization, and maybe all of them. Yet, there is a space within the photograph for autonomy. And maybe to go to this question that you posed to Erica and that Erica herself posed in her presentation about what is Latin American photography or what would it be, well, maybe it's some sort of grammar internal to certain kinds of photographs that is unique and not, um, yes, it's conventional, yes, it's invented, yes, it's sort of culturally contingent, but then within playing within those rules that are invented, people are innovating and challenging other photographic practices. Um, maybe it's that. It's also you know, phot photography in Latin America looks a lot like photography everywhere else in the world. Um, that, you know, that that's, that we can learn a lot about photography in the United States by studying photography in Latin America, um, because they're not that different in some fundamental ways. Um, and then I would keep this distinction, at least a heuristic distinction between the art photograph and the vernacular photograph, um, because of, for that reason, that we want to eventually be able to make claims about the artist's intentionality. Um, 
And then this question about autonomy. If most of the photos in the world are privatizing and the examples that Marcos gave us were brilliant, um, right? This is, that is raw um, violence that he, that this Austrian dude is documenting with his camera, um, hunting, etc. And he says it and Marcos uh, theorizes it for us. And I think what Marcos did in his presentation was enact a way of counteracting that violence, uh, of recontextualizing those images, of bringing them into the present to, to collide with contemporary issues of settler colonialism, uh, resource extraction, dispossession of indigenous peoples. Um, and that is an, uh, a way of reanimating those images and redirecting them toward a more liberatory potential uh, that I that I think is a, a it's an opportunity for all of us and I think he he demonstrated one way a powerful way to do that uh, I can think of other examples there's a, a an amazing sort short documentary film for for Glandia Malays by a Brazilian um, filmmaker uh, pardon my pronunciation but Susana de Souza Diaz um, it's a beautiful 41 minute film where she just takes the archival photographs of Fordlandia and then she goes with her film, her camera to, con to the present and, and sort of films people in their community in Fordlandia, but you puts the archival images into it. And it, it sort of, it's very powerful and it counteracts that privatizing impulse. The other, uh, another, I can think of other examples, but um, another one would be Damiana Krigi, if you've seen that film by Alejandro Fernandez Mohan, and you know, an Argentine filmmaker who who took the documentary, who took the photographs of their brutal photographs of an indigenous girl named Damiana Krigi, uh, who was kidnapped basically by settler colonists in um, today in what has been Paraguay, early 20, uh, late 20th, late um, 20th century Paraguay. And anyway, these photographs were used by German scientists to talk about racial inferiority and they're subjectifying images in which she's naked in front of the camera and they're, you know, it's, it's, it's what you would, you know, the scientific racism of the early 20th century. But what he does is he takes those images and it becomes a film about repatriating her remains from the uh, museo, the, the big museo in uh, La Plata. Um, God, I can't remember the name of it, but the big museum. Um, and anyhow, the, the film reworks those images in very interesting ways. And we can think of other examples, but that's, yeah, that's all I'd have to say on that. Thank you. Ray, Nelson? thank you. Nelson? Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, can I just ask, uh, uh, Kevin, could you please uh, repeat the name of this last uh, film that you talk? Do you know the name? Maybe I can try to find it. Okay. Damian, is, is this the name? I thought was the, about the, okay, it's the girl and the name. Okay, thanks. Can I, Marcos? Uh, when I was hearing the, the, the talk of uh, Erica, I was thinking questions that Marcos uh, bring to, to the, the thinking. Because in the 80s here in Brazil, we have uh, a counter movement of photographers, of uh, racialized photographers in Brazil, especially uh, related to black movements, as, just like uh, Januário Garcia, Jonatas Conceição, Lita Cerqueira. So my question to Erica is, if there is uh, a possibility to, to 
see this movement, to, this practice of uh, institutionalization of photography through a racial question, through a racial, because through the, the black movements, there was a question about uh, to take the, the black culture as a subject of photography and not take the black photographer as actor of his practice. So I, I know uh, in the 80s, in the 80s, uh, the Cimarrones, the Palenques, the Quilombos, and the, the, the black organizations was in the in the point of the focus of the black movements and uh, the, the field of uh, Afro-Latin studies. So what about the photography of Latin America with these groups, these black movement groups? Because today there there is a, a discussion about uh, from whom belongs the, the photography that white people did of black people when in the, in the certain moment of the history, black moments are competing for photography too, for the photography practice. So what are the implication of all these traditions of uh, white photographers doing black photography of black person or black groups when there is on another scene in the same period in the 18s and the 19s of black photographers or black movement photographers that are not in the institutions. So for example, Januar Garcia is not in the in the Funarte, or Lazaro Roberto is not in the in the in Funarte. The the Cimarrones, the Palenques are not in the institutions. So what are the implication of this? Because because of, of the question when I when I saw your book about uh, the the woman in photography, uh, I miss a black woman in photography. So, what is the question? American? Mm, I'm not sure if I understood the last part about the book, but you were right. Uh, there was, uh, when we opened the, co because the book uh, is a result of a seminar that we had at MAC, the Museum of Contemporary Art, and there was an open call for uh, for research on women in Latin America and photography, and we had only one um, only one researcher that sent us the, a, a, a paper proposal about a women a woman a, a black photographer. So that's uh, was yeah that was one thing that we tried to have any uh, um, uh, we had we wanted to 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 have more of this but we had only this one uh, proposal and he's in the book his text is in the book he, and but uh, to to answer you about Latin American photography, what I can tell you is that uh, the black movement was movement wasn't an issue in the catalog, and wasn't an issue in the ponencias in the talks during the 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 colloquia. Uh, there was uh, a lot of talk about indigenous peoples and about folklore and how it should be uh, portrayed, how to escape, um, uh, how do you say when it's like uh, aestheticized, you know, how not to aestheticize uh, um, and make it um, the, I, uh, how the word. Uh, Portuguese. <laughs> no, I'm not saying Portuguese. <laughs> Sumiu. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not know, fetishized. Yeah, it's not, there's a word, there's a good word for that and I can't remember it. But anyway, to, to aestheticize this uh, uh, traditional uh, things and to fetishize it and to, uh, to make it 
like the otherness how do you say when you make it odd and like the otherness like the um, exotic <gasps> exotic i remember like uh, uh, how not to turn it in, into exoticism you know and something like this so but not specific is spe specifically on black movement what i can tell you is that rosa gaditano she was uh according to her she was one of the only uh um, um, she was the uh she she and another friend of hers that she says she took him with her uh, to photograph the first um, protest of the of the black movement in sao paulo in the uh, beginning of the 80s so that's an issue for her and she used to work for versus which is a, a, a which was um, a, a, a newspaper of the, the, the uh, cri criticizing dictatorship, these uh, alternative newspapers, and they they call themselves the newspaper of, of Latin America, and they had um, a, a column uh, on black on the black movement and on black issues, and she co would contribute to this. But of course, she's white; she's not black and i i'm not uh, but that's what i can tell you because it it really wasn't something that would appear in my researches i think uh, the indigenous people issues are more more present in this in these uh, documents that i research <laughs> yeah, you can you can you can wrap up the section if you want. <laughs> I think everybody is very tired here, but uh, anyway, it was a great opportunity to have Kevin here, to have Erica, and to have Marcus, and all the group that is keeping uh, with us in the sections of the seminar. Also, who teaches in in Bahia and uh, and uh, Mariana, who just left, was our co-author in the in the in the article we are we are really excited about your presence here and uh, i think we have a a, a very good uh, uh, amount of of reflections here uh, to to develop uh, these presentations in a, 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 in a conference by the end of this project so uh, let's pray for all the gods from all <laughs> the the orishas also because we need to keep this country uh, up without dictator dictatorship anyway and uh, to to and i would like to to in spite of the jokes and so on we like to, to to thank you kevin it was a great opportunity to discuss your book and uh, I, we promise that we are, we are going to write a wonderful review about this. Yeah, we have three uh, we have three authors here for for the reviews. Marcos, Marcos, and I can also contribute to it. And uh, it, it it was a pleasure uh, to have you all here. And thank you so much uh, for the time. And uh, and uh, we have this section. Uh, uploaded in the Laboy seminar, Laboy channel, in the in the YouTube, and we we'll try to put uh, uh, subtitles in it as soon as possible. Okay. Thank you all, and it was so nice to see you again, Ana Maria and Erica and Marcos. Thanks for your papers, and to all of you, Marcos. Yeah. You're welcome. We thank you too. No, no. It was a pleasure. Thank you. So, so you see you soon in our next uh, next uh, uh, the last one will be in in the, by the end of October we have uh, Maria do Carmo Rain who will discuss about uh, uh, fashion and archive and, 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 and photograph collections and we'll have uh, 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 other uh, researchers doing uh, talking with us about the same issue also so thank you Kevin we keep in touch and uh, as soon as, as uh, uh, next year we'll meet uh, 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 in person okay bye 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 thank you all bye 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 bye, -bye. See ya. have bye -bye. a nice day
Deixa eu parar de gravar. <risos> Vamos parar. É. Ah. Gente, é... Eu já...